Salutations. Welcome to Pod Mortem. I'm Renee Hunter Vasquez, joined as always by my co-host, my husband and my brother. Hi, I'm John Paul Vasquez. Hi, I'm Travis Hunter. This week, we're recording live from a suspicious cornfield discussing the 2002 supernatural horror film, Signs. This film was written and directed by M. Night Shyamalan. Much more than the alien invasion movie that it seems to be at first glance, Signs deals with themes of family, grief, and faith. Although there are polarizing opinions surrounding this film's patented M. Night Shyamalan twist ending, Signs is still hailed as one of the director's best works. Signs was the winner of our January Patreon poll, so thank you to all of our patrons who participated and voted. If you want to help us pick an episode, join us over on the Patreon at patreon.com slash thepodmortem. So, what did you guys think about Signs the first time you saw it? I don't actually remember the first time I saw it, but I do remember that I enjoyed the movie. Mm -hmm. Uh, I won't say it's a scary movie. (laughs) Because it, like, it doesn't have anything very frightening in it. I completely I, I disagree. disagree. <laughs> well, then we have different definitions of frightening. Okay. <laughs> uh, I will say that it it's very cool. The stuff they do is very cool. But yeah, I I don't I can't say honestly that I was ever genuinely scared of anything that was happening. Even when you movie. were younger. Uh. Well, I mean, in 2002, I was 18. So, oh, well. I yeah. mean, <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't. Which is younger? Was, uh, I, mean, well, I mean, I was younger, but <laughs> that's, that's how time works, yeah. man. <laughs> <laughs> but I was still right. Yeah. <laughs> but it is a, but it is a good movie. I do enjoy this movie. I very much agree with enjoying this movie. Yeah. I know that Nay and I saw this with our parents in theaters, mm-hmm. and I was 11, I think you must have been around 13, mm-hmm. and there are like two or three moments, I feel like maybe it's just kids of a certain age. I, oh no, I bet, and I was younger, then I'm pretty sure I would have, you know what I mean? Yeah. But at, at 18, like I said, I thought I was fucking- Invincible. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, this like, isn't scary. We'll put <laughs> an alien in the yeah, face. But then I'm watching it like two or three times. So uh-huh. I mean, it is a good <laughs> so movie. So at least you liked yeah, it. Yeah, it is a good movie. I remember like coming away from it. I don't, I don't know why, but whenever I thought about going back in time in my mind, mm-hmm. sitting in the theater watching this movie, right. I remember leaving it thinking that this might be one of the best films I've ever seen in my life yeah i remember right. thinking that yeah and i think that i th- enjoyed it then for different reasons mm-hmm. than i enjoy it now right back then i think it was those like few because there's like formative horror moments oh yeah and there's like two or three that stick with i think it must be the age group thing right right because right. we fucking rewatch the hell out of that film yeah <laughs> when, <laughs> when it came out on dvd and it was always those moments where we were like yeah. super tense there were moments as a kid that i was like i don't know if i can handle this yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just hit a panic button yeah and just my brain's uh. like you can stay but i'm leaving but i mean i think that now i really appreciate how the story and the drama Right, right. The drama's good. Like, they just unfold in such a... I mean, it's a very organically written story. Yeah. That it just works. Right. And I think that I appreciate the craft of it more mm-hmm. now. I do feel bad in hindsight, and I have told Nay a million times that I need to go rewatch The Village. Right. But in my brain, I've always considered signs... Tread lightly. <laughs> <laughs> Tread very lightly. I've always considered signs M. Night's last great film. Is it my turn to talk? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> I am, and I'm sure I've said this before in some way, shape, or form, but I'm the resident M. Night apologist at the table. I love him and even his bad shit i'm like yeah but he gave us the six cents though like that was just in his brain like he gave that to us and he didn't ask anything in return that well he got a lot of money yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, hold on I, he was paid handsome. I, I will also go on record that the village is the shit and if just rewatch it okay I'll rewatch it. See, I left. I'm. An, I've got an open you did, mind. You did. I've got an open mind. The village is great. I know that that is not a popular opinion. I'm not gonna sit up here and be like Lady in the Water because you know whatever. <laughs> but the village is really really good. Like um, Resident Evil, the village or he's like the video game. Yeah, right. No, <laughs> no uh, it's a really good movie. But Signs, I wouldn't say it's his last great one. I will say it is a great one. It's fantastic. <laughs> it the age that I saw it. I, I don't know if that was like the target audience yeah. for signs, but <laughs> I feel like literally millions of 
preteens slash teens bonded over that one moment that y'all all know what I'm talking <laughs> right. about that collectively scared the fucking shit out of us. We mm-hmm. were all, and it's like <laughs> 0.2 seconds of the movie, but yeah. it rocked my shit. Like I was like, <laughs> I think, I don't know if I it was here on the show or on talk morning where I talked about getting scared and feeling tingly yeah. armpits. Oh yeah. But that, that is a tingly armpit moment. And it's I can still, see it. Like, I can understand. I, the shit like it genuinely fucking terrified me i was i was him in the scene yeah <laughs> <laughs> just screaming in the theater but um as i do like you said to get older and watch it because i've seen this dozens of times mm-hmm. it just kind of keeps giving more i will say there's a very subtle element or aspect of this film that i did not even notice until watching this time i'm intrigued um we'll get into it but i was like that and the fact that he's not like this this is because of this like it's a little crumb that he never talks about again and you have to put it together i feel like we're talking about the same thing because there was a moment that i was like how did i never notice yeah that? I, it probably is but yeah um m night is such a i feel like very thoughtful writer <laughs> uh, you know he can be a little self-indulgent at times and i'm sure we'll talk about that too but mm. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm uh very interested because it i like i said i do enjoy the movie but i won't say it was as strong for me this time wow it, it i think i think it had the opposite effect me being older i was like i don't like there was a few things and when we get to it out i really didn't care for at all okay oh, and wow. i was like i i could not that it hurt the movie but uh, in my own, like me, uh, I could have done without. Like, it's just like, I don't. I'm interested to, yeah. to hear mm-hmm. what the. I will say it's not as scary right. to me, but it's. Well, because you know the movie, right? Though. Yeah, it's the true. quality yeah. of it, though, has not dipped. Like, right. I feel like this movie is excellent. It's a very, very good. It is good. good. I think it's kind of there's something timeless about it because mm-hmm. I feel like it's made with like an like an older filmmaker sensibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard to even imagine. I think he was like 31 when he made this. That son of a bitch. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it hurts to even think about. Frankly, he did. I read have everybody watch the birds multiple times, and I feel that. Yeah. I also read that wow. during the production, like whenever he was coming together with the idea, he was thinking about Night of the Living Dead. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. I can definitely see that. It's interesting. See, for me, I love hearing the influences that brought people to the film, you know? Yeah. Because it's such an original thing on its own. But then when you hear that, you're like, I can totally see. You can see the like skeleton. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I think the thing that gets me the most is that he was kind of becoming the new Hitchcock is what people were hailing him as. And they were, I mean... He's Look, coming uh, off. We all make mistakes. <laughs> well, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm not going to sit here. Uh, <laughs> all I'm saying is he's coming off the sixth sense. He's coming off of Unbreakable. Now, Unbreakable did not get the respect it Unbreakable deserved. Unbreakable is fucking phenomenal. That's, it's amazing. Bruce Willis, Samuel L. Jackson. That's the first one, though. Right? Yeah. That one was a good movie. Phenomenal. Yeah. That was a good movie. I, I think I'm saying all this because I I don't I feel like I've been painted as an M night like hater. Listen. <laughs> I love this dude. I'm not the one holding the brush. <laughs> <laughs> now before we put a tinfoil hat on this film, we would like to issue a warning for spoilers. Podmortem is a very in-depth podcast, and in thoroughly discussing horror films, we have no choice but to spoil a thing or two. If you don't wish to be spoiled, please go watch the film, then come back and enjoy the show. If you've already seen the film or don't care about spoilers, then let's swing away. After a couple minutes of dramatic credits set to very intense music, we come up on a farmhouse. I want to talk about that opening really quick. Yeah. That it, was a lot. It was, it was a whole lot. <laughs> it put me in the mind of Psycho. Definitely. And it kind of delivers this dramatic music that you're like, well, they're going to have to eventually reach these heights at some point. Yeah. You right. Know? The same thing with that we said on Psycho, where it's like, well, something very big is yeah, happening. Yeah, you're setting the tone. Yeah, here. yeah. I wanted to talk about the composer. It was a guy called James Newton Howard. And not only was he, well, not he is still alive. Not only is he a nine time Oscar nominee, but he scored basically every single M. Night film. Nice. <laughs> so they have this like really good working relationship. Yeah. I watched this featurette of them in the studio together, like figuring out everything. 
And he writes M. Night very detailed scripts with storyboards of how he's going to frame every single shot. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of delivered that to him. And he wrote this main theme based on the storyboards. Huh. Oh wow! And it fits. That's interesting. Yeah. Like I, I. Well, love I feel this. like just from Jump, you're like, okay, like we're about what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. The music was just. I was. I was like, all right. To know, start. Like, yeah. I was like, <laughs> yeah. that's a lot, but go off. You know what I mean? That's... In the house, though, we see a framed portrait of the family, presumably that lives there, mm-hmm. and the father is wearing a priest's collar. Suddenly, the father, Graham Hess, played by Mel Gibson, sits straight up in bed with a gasp. He's alone. He looks around the house, listening at his kids' doors before going to brush his teeth. Now, I don't know when we want to talk about Mel Gibson. I figure we got to get it out of the way up top. Um, I will say <laughs> that his actions have impacted me <laughs> deeply. <laughs> the most? The most. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid, I watched Braveheart with my right. dad. And I looked at Mel Gibson and I was like, he's the best of us. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that man is courage and bravery personified. I, I just want to say, I think I've determined why they don't allow kids to vote. <laughs> <laughs> he is the chosen one. Like, You could not have told me that Mel Gibson was not. I just watched Braveheart too young. <laughs> <laughs> it sucks because the thing is, is that you really see how good of an actor he is. He is. Because he never lets on that he's a scumbag piece of shit. And he is. It's just very, very upsetting. But that's one thing that I guess, I mean, there is an ability to separate the art from the artist. Right. And I think that's a lot easier to do with material that was made before shit happened. We were looking it up yesterday, and I think it was 06 that the whole sugar tits and anti-Semitic rant. Mm -hmm. And so, like, four years after this. Mm -hmm. And so it's like... God damn it. Like it just it's it makes me so mad. Because he has such a presence on screen. Right. Yeah. And I think that's one that's what sucks so bad is that's something you can't take away from him. You're like, God damn, this this <laughs> fucking racist piece of shit yeah. is a great actor. <laughs> that's why it's easy for me to separate them and just like or not like, get attached right. yeah. to directors or actors because it's like, okay, well, I I you you did what? All right. I, you know, like, I, I was waiting for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I was waiting for You're it. waiting for these people to let yeah, you down. Yeah, so it's like, all right. <laughs> He was Braveheart. Yeah, I know. <laughs> was that his name? <laughs> yeah. I thought he was Lethal Weapon. What yeah, what happened to that? <laughs> but as he's brushing his teeth on the wall outside of his bathroom, we see the outline of a cross that used to hang there, but no longer does. So I feel like this says a lot without saying anything. Right. Mm-hmm. A little girl begins to scream and Graham runs to his daughter's room, but she's not in there. Graham's brother, Meryl, played by Joaquin Phoenix, is awakened by the scream as well, but he completely flops out of his bed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We love Joaquin Phoenix. Yes, yes, yes. In this house. I love him as a person and as an actor. Yeah. He just seems like such a cool dude. Mm -hmm. I did see on Entertainment Weekly that apparently Mark Ruffalo was originally cast for this role. Mm. And in all fairness, he kind of... (laughs) I could see him and Mel Gibson being brothers. being brothers. I could see that fitting. But from what I read on there, as well as other sources, he apparently found out that he had a brain tumor. And so... Oh, I, yeah. I, I remember. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, luckily, it was benign. Okay. Yeah. But he got it removed. And so one week before they started shooting, the second Joaquin Phoenix yeah. came in to take on the role. Oh, all right. So it's just like it wasn't even meant to... Well, yeah. we do. I mean, it's, there's a lot. It's, <laughs> it's like it's it was nuts. meant to be. Yeah. But Graham runs outside meeting Meryl, who's also running out of the guest house. Now, both kids are screaming from the cornfield, calling both Graham and Meryl. They run through the stalks of corn until they find Graham's daughter, Bo, played by Abigail Breslin, standing by herself. And this is her first movie role. Right. It's nuts to see where these kid actors yeah. like went she's right, right, so right. fucking cute in this like, very she's adorable, adorable. Uh, i know i've seen her i have no idea who she is abigail breslin i don't know Z- what that means zombie land i don't know what that means okay. you don't know what zombie land means I, i've seen that movie like twice i think and i've never watched the second one i know she's in both uh spider-man the girl that plays in spider-man Emma in one Stone? Of them. yeah yeah and I know... Yeah, she's the other girl that's Carnage not in, is in there. <laughs> and then I know the guy who gets mistaken for Michael Sarah is in there. Or is it Michael no. Sarah? Jesse Eisenberg. Yeah. 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 They're the same whoever. person, I believe. Yeah, whoever. <laughs> <laughs> See, don't get attached. There you go. And you don't have to worry. <laughs> but Graham grabs her and asks where her brother is. But Bo just asks if Graham is in her dream too. 
Meryl picks up Bo and they run in the direction of Graham's son's voice until they find him. Morgan, played by Rory Culkin, explains that the dogs woke them up barking. I feel like we just talked about Rory (laughs) Culkin. I first of all, I just want to say the thing about are you in my dream too? Yeah, this sets up a thing that kind of is yeah. touched on throughout mm-hmm. that I didn't really pay much mind to when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. But the more I think about it, the weirder. Yeah, it kind and of the is. fact that it's not even like a main focal point of the mm-hmm. film. It's no. just like this thing that's happening in the background. It's like okay. <laughs> I was also a little taken aback because Rory Culkin in this film Mm -hmm. was, I believe, two years older than me whenever the film was made. And then Joaquin Phoenix watching it now when this film was made is two years younger than me. And so I kind of felt very weird. You're like, I'm in this movie. (laughs) Yeah, I'm I was I played the part of the corn. (laughs) But the thing, uh, the reason about the ages, I'm not just trying to talk about myself. (laughs) (laughs) The point to me is that the eyes that I viewed the film through, Mm -hmm. I think I identified with the kid when I was in the theater. But now I, you know, something weird about aging and revisiting films. Yeah. But I mean, that shows you the staying power of the film, though. Right. Like, that's how I know I'm getting old is when, like, I watch movies and the parents, I'm like, why won't you guys just listen to your parents? And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> Fight the no, you, system. You kids are fucking bad. <laughs> <laughs> They're just trying to help you. Yeah. <laughs> but Graham asks if Morgan is hurt. But Morgan ignores this, simply saying that he thinks God did it. He turns his dad's face in the direction that he's looking and Graham goes further in to investigate. Finally, he sees it as he steps into it. A huge circle of the corn laid flat onto the field. The dogs are running around in it and barking. We get an aerial view that confirms that there is more than one of these crop circles dwarfing the Hess family with their size. It fades to black and we get a card that reads Bucks County, Pennsylvania, 45 miles outside Philadelphia. So, of course, M. Night is filming outside of Philadelphia. Yeah, right. of course. <laughs> I want to talk about these crop circles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're, first of all, the idea of them is horrifying. I know 99% of them are bullshit. Yeah. Probably 100% of them are bullshit. Not 100. Well, we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> but I did see on that featurette that they had permission to film in this area from a agricultural college. Ah, okay. And they actually grew the corn mm-hmm. for this film. <laughs> so the corn's real. Yeah. And also real is every single crop circle you see in this film. It looks real. No, oh, yeah. Like it's cuz M Night apparently said that he hates CGI. Even though a lot of it is used yeah. in this film. Uh, yeah. But any time that they could do it practically, he wanted to. And I you gotta respect yeah. that. Yeah. And speaking of real, also, since we're just getting out of the way, the house was built for this film. That I I I did want I was watching uh Scary Movie Three for this movie <laughs> last night. Specifically. Yes. Um <laughs> And that was one thing that I did notice too, even in that movie. I prefer when they shoot on location as to where a set because Uh I noticed a lot of back and forth and I was like, man, I really wish you would just stay outside and film or you would, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because you can tell a different tone and when it's outside Mm -hmm. or like they're out in the world doing it until when they're in a fucking studio and it's like, you not all the time because I guess, I can't remember what movie it was. Sometimes it's surprising. Sometimes you can't, you can't tell but I was just like, man, I, I don't know why, but I prefer seeing you guys outside doing yeah. stuff. They did switch back and forth because I think a couple of the rooms in the house are really built sets, yeah. but they do it so seamlessly in this right. film that you don't even notice. No, no. And I and that's what I did enjoy. And you saying that about the corn and all that, because I've seen a documentary before how to make how they were doing the crop circles. Uh-huh. And I was like, damn, that takes time. But it looks just like it looks everywhere when they're yeah. like yeah. oh it's aliens it's like no <laughs> the guy goes i got a two by four with the string on it on each side could and it be I, yeah, I was any like, simpler fuck? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, right. but yeah it was it was a trip watching him do it yeah but yeah i do enjoy practical effects and no no cgi not mm-hmm. saying that cgi is bad but i am glad knowing that they did that for this movie and it's nuts because especially later on when we see how big things get yeah yeah, yeah. they all of them that's pretty incredible yeah i what would have been funny if it was just like it just said doug or it was just like a giant penis or something in there 
Um, but again, I watch scary movies <laughs> exactly, for yeah. this. I, I feel for like the, that would have ruined this film. <laughs> I don't know. Scary Movie 3 is really funny. I'm happy <laughs> for you. <laughs> but back at the farmhouse, Graham looks out of his screen over to the crops as he talks on the phone. He tells the person on the other end that he doesn't care if it was local troublemakers. It was strange to see the crops that way. His kids are confused and it would bring some peace to know if it was just simply Lionel and the Wolfington brothers <laughs> messing around. <laughs> That sounds like the greatest indie band of all time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, we f- we find later from him mentioning names that he's talking to Lionel's dad mm-hmm. right now oh. on the phone. Yeah, because I was like, who the hell is he talking to? But he hears on the other end of the phone that Lionel was at the movie, uh, presumably with the Wolfington brothers. <laughs> they were at the movies last night, so it wasn't them. And he gets off the phone. He walks into the kitchen where Bo and Morgan stand in front of their dog, Houdini. Houdini is lying on the floor next to a puddle of urine. Morgan tells Graham that he thinks Houdini might be sick. Graham tells the kids to take Houdini outside and he'll call Dr. Crawford. Morgan's like, that's a human doctor. And Graham's like, oh, well, I'm sure he'll know what to do. This I didn't even really think about until something later. And this Mm -hmm. is the thing that I didn't put together literally until watching it this time. Same. And it was... I, whenever I wrote it in my notes, I was like, why the fuck are they right. like, why would he do that? I think it's because we've been, we've become friends with a couple of veterinarians over the past couple yeah. of years right. and we're like, well, why don't they just call? Yeah, no, they, they yeah. that dog needs a vet. Yes. Um, <laughs> I looked at it as like, oh, this is such a small town. Like maybe they don't have a vet. Mm. The doctor kind of does double duty. Right. But then like, it seems like everybody lives on a farm. Why would they not have a vet? I, it was just, I don't know. It like struck me as weird this time when every other time I watched it, I didn't even really think about it. Well, I think I just didn't understand. I thought I was like, well, if he can check my cough, what's what's different between me and a horse? Are you Kramer? <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, hey, if the, if the cough sounds yeah. the same. <laughs> but the kid says he's not. He's not a vet. And yeah. He's like, yeah. He's like, oh, oh, well. it'll be fine. Yeah. So I was like, well, something's wrong. Well, we, yeah. were, uh, we were like, well, it's yeah. Mel Gibson. Yeah. He knows. Because yeah. <laughs> like, we were. I, yeah. Better. Whatever that man says, <laughs> you follow that man. Yikes. Man, I'm sad again. <laughs> but Graham starts to wipe up the pee. And when he goes to throw the paper towels away, he runs into Officer Carolyn Posky, played by Cherry Jones, who's just standing in his house. Cherry Jones is great. Yes. Before we go on, I got a question. Hmm. Why is he cleaning that up with the hand that doesn't have a glove? And where did the glove come from? He had a, I don't know. Oh, I didn't notice. That. Yeah, he has a glove on one hand and then he cleans up the pee with the other hand <laughs> and then he never washes his hands. There's a lot going on. I, I, I mean, I get that, <laughs> but I, I didn't understand the. Uh, I didn't even notice that. I didn't catch that uh, either. I was like, wh- I was like, where the fuck did that glove come from? I was like, what the hell is that? Well, I feel like you put it, if you. You put it on the pee hand. Yeah. Well, but if you're wiping it and then you got to crumple it with your hand yeah, to put it in the like, trash. I mean, then wear two gloves. You're just squeezing the piss out. Two <laughs> gloves? What do you think we're I made mean, of? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. think money two? grows yeah. on corn stalks? <laughs> yeah. Oh. <Right. laughs> Literally, yes. Wait, that's what farming yeah. is? <laughs> right. Fuck. God damn. I'm in the wrong <laughs> business. <Yeah. laughs> you're going to say but Graham makes a snide remark about only having called them two hours ago. Carolyn immediately launches off into a story about an old woman who twisted her ankle jumping out of the way when a bunch of kids on skateboards came riding by. So she went to the store to spit on the new skateboards to be sold. By the time Carolyn got there, she said she sprayed the whole store and she won't eat for a week because the old lady must have had a cold. Then she takes a deep breath and is like, what happened to the crops? <laughs> <laughs> I hope that old woman gets prosecuted to the <laughs> fullest yes. extent of the law. That is fucking disgusting. It's a biological weapon. It is. It's these times, man. <laughs> yes. Outside, Morgan is flipping meat that's cooking on the grill, muttering that his dad is going to burn it again. That's where the glove came from. From the burgers? He oh. must have been out there on the grill. But why didn't you show that? Or why did I don't It's probably cut. <sighs> I but thought that's, a, that's because it just came out of eye, nowhere. Yeah. And I was like, "What the? F- why is he wearing a fucking glove?" Since I didn't see the glove at all, I swear I thought you were talking like for a plastic glove. glove. Oh, yeah, yeah no, no, that's no, what no. I was, that's what I was got, like, uh, "Use the pee." Like, like a, no, like he a had like a yeah, like a giant glove, but it looked like a. Uh, like the ones when dogs attack the trainers. Oh. And I was like, why does he got that big ass glove on? <laughs> That's why I was confused. And He's, But that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. He's like, just in case I got to fight yeah, this dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's already acting weird enough. Yeah. <laughs> 
But Morgan goes over to Bo, who's drinking a glass of water and sitting with Houdini. After taking a sip, she tells Morgan that the water's contaminated and hands him the glass. He tells her that she doesn't even know what contaminated means. He takes a sip and says it's just regular tap water and tells Bo to pour it in Houdini's bowl. Bo protests that it tastes funny, but when Morgan reminds her that Houdini licks his own butt, she's like, yeah, that's true. And she wow. pours the water in his bowl. I want to point out that we've talked about this a lot on the show, how child actors can make or break yeah. a film. I feel like these child actors are fantastic. Yeah. And Rory Culkin plays Morgan with such an odd maturity. Yeah. Right. I mean, we learn later I, maybe why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I feel like there's like a line because there's Morgan mature and then there's well, the little boy from the ring. Aiden. Aiden right. mature. Well, Aiden, when Aiden, I feel like is possessed by like a 17th century <laughs> full grown man. <laughs> this seems believable. in the fact that he may have, he may kind of be stepping up and taking care of his sister mm-hmm. more than he should be fair. Like it reads as believable. Yeah. He's just always been, it was mean Creek before this or after I want to say after that movie is. It, yeah. It's bleak. Yeah. It's really good. I di- our friend Dylan Mm-hmm. brought it up i don't know some months ago and i was like mm-hmm. it's been entirely too long so i rewatched it it's still good no it's, it's still good and very sad yeah there's moments yeah but the, the my point was rory culkin <laughs> is great <laughs> we no matter what his age yeah. Yeah. <laughs> out of nowhere houdini barks loudly at Bo and starts to growl at her Bo stands up, but Morgan calmly cautions her not to run. Houdini stands up aggressively and continues to bark and growl at Bo. This was like, it just happened so suddenly. Mm-hmm. And as someone who was bitten by a dog, it was, uh, I don't want to say triggering, but it, it was it's <laughs> it gotcha. representative of how like things can just turn on a dime. And it's so much worse that that's their dog that they love and right. they're trying to take care of. Mm-hmm. But didn't just, like the water. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> fucking tap water. Yeah, you like, fucking knew this? this tasted funny. <laughs> yeah, right. Evian. Evian. What is this? <laughs> I don't want to start a war here, but I do want to say that cats. You don't have to worry <laughs> if no. they're gonna chew out your throat. All you have to—they will eat your eyeballs after you die. But <laughs> no, they will. That's yeah, they fine. Will. I don't. I'm not. I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> But just as this is going on, we cut over to Carolyn and Graham at the crop circle. Carolyn calls Graham father as she asks what kind of machine would bend these crops over without breaking them. Graham says that it's too perfect to be done by hand. And Carolyn says this basically exonerates Lionel and the Wolfington brothers (laughs) who can't take a piss without wetting the front of their pants. Carolyn tells him that she doesn't think anyone else is having this problem because she was at somebody else's farm yesterday and he didn't mention anything. Graham asks why she was over there and Carolyn says that some of the animals around here have been acting strangely and some of them have been getting violent. Graham asks if it's a virus and Carolyn says she doesn't think so. They're just edgy and alert like if there were a predator around, they're even peeing on themselves. Animals always know. Yeah, Mm -hmm. but the fact that you were just cleaning up your dog's piss, like that would turn my stomach, her Mm -hmm. saying that. Right. That's scary. No, yeah, and that's weird. I don't want to get off topic, but it it, is... It's weird to think about that because I was reading a uh, article about how birds can see magnetic waves. That's how they're able to navigate because like they know where to go when it gets cold. They know where to right. go to get back yeah. home. It's something they have to do with their eyes or the uh, God. I'm I'm I know I'm fucking this up, but the way that they that they see, they're mm-hmm. able to see the waves and they know where to go. So they have like a built in fucking compass that's telling them, hey, go this way. Mm-hmm. It's really weird, though. Animals are fucking. No, yeah, like, they definitely sense shit that yeah. we don't. I think like random stuff like that just shows how they're on a different level of perception. Yeah. Oh no, yeah. Like you ever see an animal like tense up before the doorbell rings? Yeah, yeah well, no, I mean, they, yeah. you're like, what yeah. the yeah. hell? <laughs> think about it though. We're like, no, I can't sleep without my white noise. Like we're so yeah. fucking like <laughs> bougie and pampered. Uh-huh. Like they don't. They're on, like you said. They're on an entirely they different are. level. <laughs> Yet they're licking their assholes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> explain that explain and that somehow their mouths are cleaner than ours give that like, the fuck to yeah you. i don't it's like and i lick my ass yeah. like so i don't know what the fuck you guys are oh, doing look into that yeah maybe. <laughs> but her mentioning that the animals have been peeing on themselves makes graham stand up and begin to walk away he asks her to please stop calling him father and when she asks him what's wrong he says that he can't hear his kids that's real shit right there. yeah mm. When Carolyn and Graham come out of the crops, they see Morgan sitting next to Houdini. Now, this is very, very sad and very horrible. So 
maybe skip a few seconds ahead if you know you love dogs <laughs> but houdini has sharp tongs from the grill buried into his throat Morgan is crying and using his inhaler. He tells Graham that Houdini fell on him when he was trying to kill Bo. Bo sits in the small playground, scared. After confirming that Morgan wasn't hurt, he puts a reassuring hand on his son's shoulder and tells him that he's so sorry. But Morgan just takes his hand off of his shoulder and walks away. That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, well, in all honesty, I mean... I would be a little mad too. Like, first of all, I saved the burgers. Yeah. Yeah. You're not even out here watching the food. Yeah. Where the fuck are you? (laughs) But I think one thing that did get me, of course, was we talked about it with Barb on Black Christmas. Directors just can't get the inhaler right. Like, no, but uh, this is closer. But this child did a better job. (laughs) (laughs) She's sucked on the inhaler. (laughs) Like there's just a steady stream of it. But he he puffed in and immediately blew it out. Well, like, you know, he's, he's smoking kid, the inhaler. <laughs> <laughs> he is hot boxing it. Well, that's another Graham. Teach your son how to use his inhaler. Yeah. Like, uh, where are you, dude? That's a tough thing to have to do, though, man. Oh yeah. And I was like, ah, poor kid, man. Like, I, I mean, I get it's your dog, but like, it's also your sister. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it's to like, yeah, yeah there's a tough decision to make there, and he did the right choice. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Always protect your siblings or yeah. your family, but. God damn, if that's your dog and you've had it for a while, it's that's gonna scar God, you. Even if it's be. not your dog, like that's no, scarring. Yeah, that's gotta be rough. And it's more and more seeing just how Morgan is growing up oh, yeah. so fast. Yeah. Like, and we learn more, of course. Yeah. But it's just uh, it's not the easiest childhood. No. No. But Graham picks up Bo and starts to bring her to the house where Meryl is coming out holding chips and food for the barbecue that Graham is supposed to be cooking. <laughs> He chastises Meryl, asking where he was. Bo tells Meryl that Houdini is sick, and Graham tells him to tie the other dog, Isabel, up out back and to make sure that the knot is tight. But they go inside, leaving Meryl to follow instruction and take Isabel out back as Carolyn takes the tongs out of Houdini's neck. That night, Graham awakes from his sleep startled. Now, I know that there are a couple instances of like crickets and stuff making noise, and then mm-hmm. they just stop. Yeah. I think that happens here. I think it happens a few times in the movie, yeah. Right. But I don't know if you're already. I would already be on edge because of the circle thing. Oh well, yeah. yeah, all the and shit. And then your dog. Yeah. yeah. Like I feel like now that I'm really thinking about it, they get over that pretty quickly. I know that there's a lot going on, but they get over that yeah. really, really quickly. <laughs> that is, yeah. I mean, families, man. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to say. But when he wakes up, Bo is right in his face. He asks her what's wrong, and she calmly reports that there's a monster outside her room and asks for a glass of water. Then she's a lizard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's like, what the she's fuck? Thirsty. She's a fucking McPoyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's thirsty. I did want to point out, I read this interview in The Ringer with M. Knight, and he was talking, it was like a retrospective. Mm -hmm. I think he did the interview, it was 2020. Right. But he said, like, he did a lot of things, putting things together where they seem innocuous. Yeah. Like this line right here, kids just have like a stream of consciousness thoughts, like jump from one thing to another. There's a monster outside my room. Can I have a glass of water? But he said, I put those together for a reason. Mm. Yeah. I never put that together. And I was like, you're a goddamn genius. <laughs> that's that's pretty incredible. But Graham asks what's wrong with the water next to her bed, and she says it tastes old. Is it from that beach? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> he brings her back to the room she shares with Morgan, and he tucks Morgan into bed properly because he's sleeping hanging off of it, and then he sits down with Bo. He asks what she's thinking about, and she asks him why he talks to mom when he's by himself. He tells her it makes him feel better, but when she asks if her mom ever answers him back, Graham admits that she doesn't. And Bo's like, she never answers me either. It was like very sad. Very sad. Suddenly, though, out the window, Graham sees someone standing on the roof. He wakes up Merrill, telling him that Lionel and the Wolfington brothers are back. <laughs> <laughs> Meryl is very ready, but Graham asks him to take it easy because Lionel's dad is his friend. This is when I put together that that's who he was talking to on the phone. That makes sense. No, 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 no. (laughs) I'm with Meryl. Don't be jumping Uh, on my uh, fucking uh, roof. Yeah. (laughs) I just want to say the way that this film navigates tones is amazing because it was just very sad with what Bo said. Yeah. And then it's frightening with that shot of that silhouette. And then this part is hilarious. Yeah. So I'm like, <laughs> that's another thing is the comedy in this. Yeah. Is, I feel like 
Meryl does a lot of being the comic relief at some points, but mm-hmm. Graham is a funny on accident. Like yeah. it's just it's it's funny in the weirdest ways, but it fits. Yes. It's right. not fuck Bruce Willis. <laughs> <laughs> well, his Yikes. brother's the farmer, he's the rapper. So the, yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. I wanted to say that as well because I saw in that interview that he had said whenever he made Unbreakable, right. he said that he went too far the other way. He goes, I had a ton of jokes in the script and then I took them all out. Yeah. Unbreakable's dark. It's very yeah, dark. That's a that's dark not. film. But, but it, he said that he wanted to try and recalibrate with this film and make it a fun film as much as it is also very sad. Yeah, yeah incredibly sad. <laughs> but when he's like, take it easy, I'm friends with his dad, Meryl's like, well, we're doing his dad a favor. He has yeah. a plan. They both run outside going in opposite directions, but they have to act crazy, yelling and cursing to scare them away. Graham's like, it won't be convincing because I don't know how to curse and it's not going to sound natural. Meryl <laughs> says he can just make noises and Graham's like, Define noises. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meryl's sick of it. He asks if Graham wants them to steal something from the house next time. And just as he asks this, a motion activated light comes on outside and Graham finally gets on board. So again, I want to point out how good of an actor Mel Gibson is in this because he did convince me that he doesn't know how to act like a fucking maniac. Or curse. Or curse. And we know. And we, <laughs> we've we all heard. <laughs> we heard the voicemail. Yeah. Mel. Yikes. <laughs> Meryl counts to three and they run in opposite directions yelling. Meryl is convincing and Graham is not. (laughs) I put in my notes, which is funny because Mel, we know you be cussing. (laughs) Well, what does he say? I'm losing my mind. (laughs) I'm insane with anger. (laughs) The trash is knocked around, but when they meet on the other side of the house, there's no one there. Suddenly, though, there's a rustling above them and they can't figure out how Lionel was able to get onto the roof so quickly. I feel like they're giving this Lionel character a lot yeah. of credit. And then <laughs> we meet him in a little bit. And that's and, funny oh, all on its yeah. own. Um, <laughs> but Meryl asks if he's sure that it's Lionel Pritchard. But something hits the swing set behind them. And when they turn around, it looks like someone has run off through the cornfield. This sequence is amazing. So would that would Lionel have had to have vaulted off of the roof mm-hmm. all the way behind them to the swing set and, and then right. still With been no noise. I'd be like no. fuck yeah. like that would hurt yeah. well, because you'd break both your ankles well, yeah and he just <laughs> runs through the corn I mm-hmm. wouldn't be mad anymore this guy no. yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. like fine, maybe I, we yeah, won't teach him a lesson yeah. this guy's a world class athlete mm-hmm. that's all I'm saying I think that this is the point where I want to call out how great the sound design is in this film yeah because the way that it just works from the noises you hear up top mm-hmm. and then him going through the corn, whatever it is, Lionel or right. <laughs> Lionel, whoever. Lionel, uh-huh, yeah. going through the corn. I just feel like, and again, it's very Hitchcock because we didn't see anything. No. We saw one silhouette, but I'm already very scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The next morning, Caroline lets Morgan play with her radio and tells him he could use Bo's old baby monitor as a walkie talkie. It'll only work one way, but it'll work until she can get him an old one from the station, which I thought was very cool. Mm -hmm. Graham goes into the living room where Bo is loudly watching Dexter's lab and he (laughs) asks her to turn it down until Caroline leaves. So I love this show as a kid. Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. It was a staple. I'm the du Fromage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to point out, I noticed something that I never noticed before on screen. Mm-hmm. We see Dexter as like some kind of creature dying. And then in the next shot, we see him being dunked into a fish tank full of water. Huh. Interesting. That is right. interesting. Sure, it doesn't mean anything. No, no, no. That was not intentional. <laughs> But Bo turns it down, but before Graham leaves the room, he sees that she's stacked three full glasses of water on top of their fat back TV. <laughs> he tells her that she's too old to still be doing this. If she takes a glass of water, she needs to finish it. He asks about each one, and she tells him why she couldn't finish it. One had dust in it, another had a hair, and Morgan took a sip out of the last one, and now it has his amoebas in it. Well, I mean, she had an answer for <laughs> <She> everything. <did>. <laughs> <laughs> and knew which glass. Yeah. yeah, she's like, that one is trash. That one is like, no. <laughs> In the kitchen, Caroline asks Meryl how's work at the gas station, to which he replies, it's stimulating. Mm. She tells him that him moving in with his brother after everything that's happened was a very nice thing to do, but Meryl says he doesn't think he's helping that much. Caroline looks over at Morgan and is like, you are. On his way back to the kitchen, Graham picks up three more glasses of water off of an end table, and when he turns around, there's four more on another table. (laughs) 
defeated, he just sets them down and goes back to the table with Meryl, Caroline, and Morgan. She says that all she has so far is it was very dark. (laughs) She asks if Graham thinks it's odd that he has no description at all. They reluctantly come to the conclusion that the man was tall. But when Caroline asks if he was over six feet, Meryl just repeats, it was very dark. (laughs) No, no, she... she repeats back what they say and he answers her like she asked him a question <laughs> just like all we have is it's very dark that's right it was, uh-huh. I was like, what? <laughs> what correct yeah. yeah she asked if they were even sure if it was a man and meryl says no girls can run like that after caroline cites women in the olympics meryl shuts up graham asks what the point is Caroline says that an out-of-town woman stopped in the diner yesterday and cussed them out for not having her favorite cigarettes in the vending machine. The customers were scared and no one has seen her since. Her point is that they don't know anything about the person last night, so they need to keep their minds open to everything. Point taken, but this is very like small town cop shit connecting like... Well, but, we saw a lady in the diner, so she jumped on your roof last night. Like, but if that's nothing weird. happens there and then two weird things happen in the same day, I, I think anybody would be like, right. it must be that bitch from the <laughs> diner. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, but that's a lot. <laughs> it, it is. But why is it so hard to, to no imagine correlation. some lady out doing hood rat shit? Well, you know what I mean? My, yeah, come on, Meryl. That's sexist. I mean, that, no, that's not what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm saying is, first of all, I don't think that a person who has a brand of cigarettes that smokes that much is making those leaps yeah, and bounds. No. <laughs> <laughs> or not running away like, <laughs> uh, like through the court. Exactly. Yeah, like, no, they went that way. Max mom. <laughs> exactly. No, yeah, yeah. Yeah. She's not jumping on no. her. No. Like, did you do it? <laughs> 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 that means she might have done it, but. <laughs> Bo comes in and asks for the remote. Graham tells her to check the couch cushions and she leaves. Meryl says that excluding a woman Olympian running around last night, what could be another possibility? Carolyn shuts down his sarcasm and says she still has more questions. She asks if they know anyone who might have a grudge, perhaps a church member that's upset about Graham leaving the church. But Graham says no. Meryl's like, all right, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> sorry for the sarcasm. He's like, I had a minute to marinate. Well, <laughs> that wasn't cool. No, <laughs> that's not constructive. But he says that he's pretty strong and pretty fast. And he was running as fast as he could last night. But the person out there was just playing with them. Bo comes back to report only food in the couch cushions. And Graham tells her to change the channel on the TV. She says that she did, but it's the same thing on every station. So I do want to call out, first of all, this thing that Meryl is discussing, it's honestly infuriating because imagine if you're running as fast as you can mm-hmm. and this person just, have you ever, Whoop. like, yeah, <laughs> too fast. <laughs> there, was, there was one kid in gym class when I was younger who was faster than everyone and that motherfucker would run backwards sometimes. And <laughs> I'm like, you you mean? fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> like, Take points for showboating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Give him detention. I'm sick of this shit. <laughs> but like, it's infuriating to even think about that. But what? Is he fucking from The Incredibles? Yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> he's like catch up motherfucker he didn't say that but <laughs> um the thing that they're doing with graham's character is slowly giving you these breadcrumbs of his backstory yeah mm-hmm. is incredible yeah because you're slowly learning who he is as a character and it's kind of revealing the family as the film goes along yeah. right and it's just such a smart way to do it instead of just being like okay by the way here's exactly what happened yeah i feel like it would be be a lot easier to do just this like expositional dump or Mm -hmm. have caroline and meryl at the table being like man that night you know what i mean (laughs) like it i feel like he definitely did it the right way and kind of like slowly peeling back the layers of what's going on here right Mm -hmm. but they all go into the living room to see the breaking news report with photos of huge crop circles in india an expert, Richard Kidman, played by Clifford David, comes on the screen to explain that crop circles first came about in the late 70s and with them came new interest in extraterrestrials. But when they died out in the early 80s, they were all just dismissed as hoaxes. But this is completely different. Hundreds of people would have to coordinate to account for the speed at which they're all appearing. We see a map of India with several dots indicating the crop circles. Kidman says that this is either one of the most elaborate hoaxes ever pulled or this is real. 
I laughed because I was looking up stuff about crop circles, mm-hmm. like from the 70s and on. Right. And I guess like he is saying is exactly correct. It kind of started and then it blew up and right. then it fizzled out. Uh-huh. But I read on Wikipedia that there were these two brothers in 1991 that the were Wolfington like- brothers? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were the inspiration yeah. for the Wolfington brothers. <laughs> But they were like, oh, no, we did all those. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> you sons of bitches. So it just kind of ruined everything. That might have been what I seen. Yes. Yeah. Because it was it was two guys and they were showing how they were doing it. But mm-hmm. like, uh. how much do y'all think the government paid them to say that? Fuck, man. Or Fuck. they found <laughs> a, <laughs> Or they found a like a cheap way to get famous. Let's yeah, just that's make true. pattern no, it was in the, the fucking grass. <laughs> <laughs> we got cynicism yeah. <laughs> and conspiracy. Yeah. <laughs> Aliens exist, man. Look, I was look when I especially when this film came out, I was a regular Tom DeLong. Like I was right? <laughs> like all about this shit. And I still believe to a point. Right. Um but no, I definitely believe in aliens. I think that crop circles aren't legitimate. But I do right. think that aliens exist. Like that oh, song. Yeah. Hey, mom. There's something in the back room. Okay, it's like, why do you sound like a grown man <laughs> <laughs> with a strange accent? <laughs> Track three, if I recall. <laughs> man, we ate that shit up. Yeah, anyway, Graham stares at the TV in disbelief as Morgan takes a puff of his inhaler and remarks, extraterrestrials. Graham walks Caroline outside as she tells him that she did some research after seeing the designs in his crops. Two or three guys can make something like that with boards and ropes in one night. That's how hoaxes were done in the past. And by research, she really just talked to John Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that she at least did this. Yes, yeah. 100%. Said, leave it out. It would be like, come on. We yeah. know. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like if she was just that like, you think it's aliens? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that it can be fake. Right, right. Yeah. I do love that because... Even as a skeptic, you have to look at it as with what the guy's saying oh, on no, the TV. Yeah. If it's this speed and quantity, mm-hmm. yeah. how can you explain it? Yeah. I mean, it would have to be like so calculated mm-hmm. or right. so like pre-planned. And but, that's a lot. They didn't yeah. even have Twitter yet. <laughs> <laughs> but she says the fact that there are so many now, it's impossible that that many people are in on it. She says she can't even think straight. But before she gets back in her car, she reminds Graham that his family has been through a lot. And the last thing the kids need right now is to be worrying about craziness happening in the world. She tells him to take the kids into town to get everyone's mind on regular everyday things. She tells him to take care of himself, purposefully calling him Graham instead of father before driving away. As Graham watches her leave, we hear a news report talk about footage of a crop circle captured by a man in Bangalore. This is the 18th one in India in 72 hours. See, that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot. (laughs) That would cause me to shiver in my timbers a little bit. Yeah, shiver in my timbers. But yeah, because she said it would take like overnight to make one. Yeah. And this is 18 in three days. Mm -hmm. In a, in and uh, the deleted scene, she's got a hat that keeps growing. Mm. It's scary movie. All oh, right, that's yeah, it. No, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm lying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't this movie. But following Caroline's advice, Graham drives the family into town. Morgan asks that the radio be turned on. Meryl does, and when it is immediately talking about the crop circles, Graham shuts it off. He says no radio for a while, and Morgan is annoyed. So. How long do you really keep this from your very clearly interested kid? I honestly kind of was thinking the same thing when I was watching it because you do see Morgan get annoyed, like you said. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean, he's old enough. You yeah. know what I mean? And this is some scary shit. So, I mean, why keep it from him? I understand what the cop said. You know, hey, y'all don't need this right now. But I feel like this would be something to help us get closer. Right. You know what I mean? It's like, look, I take an interest in it too. Just like you, let's work together and, you know, be safe together. Mm -hmm. But But I I feel like what we get from Graham is it's very, this, this hurts or this is scary. So I'm just going to put this in a box and we're not, we're just not going to look at it. No. Yeah. Like, I feel like that is who, just who he is as a character. Right. And I mean, I feel like we went through something similar when COVID started right, right. and having to explain it to the kids and having to, how much is too much of the news? How much yeah. is too much of, oh, somebody else died today. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> oh, you don't do that. <laughs> yeah. hey, guess what, guys? <laughs> hey, good morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. Right. And I feel like the personality that Graham has been uh, written to be 
He's not going to let his son sit there no, and yeah. learn about the 19th crop circle in India. He doesn't want to deal with it. Yeah, but I mean, it's not it's not like you said with COVID when it's like people are, you know, dying left and right. The, the, I get it. These are just the crop circles right now. We don't know anything. It's, that's, I would it, be it, fucking scared, It is, scared, but though. I mean, wouldn't you want to be prepared and have yeah. them with with yeah. knowledge? I'm then, not saying I would turn the radio off. I'm right. saying uh, I understand why Graham did. Oh, yeah. And yeah. right now, this shit, at least right now, is very interesting and fun. Right. And if I was a kid Morgan's age, I want to know everything about it, but more <laughs> fucking Graham's like... Yeah. yeah. No, it would be interesting and fine if we didn't have one in our corn. Like yeah, y'all are no, forgetting yeah. that they literally oh, have one. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> but that is even cooler. <laughs> <laughs> We're a part of it. Yeah. We're first. <laughs> Whatever happens. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. Once in town, Morgan asks Graham for book money, which he gives him. Without another word, Morgan just walks away, instinctively holding out his hand for Bo to take. And she does, which I thought this was so sweet. And it mm-hmm. was such a because when we drop the kids off at school, Ari does that. She just right. puts his hand, puts her hand out and Jackson takes it. So it's like it's like they're real sibling. Like, I don't know. I know it's just a movie, but there's so much subtle little things that are put in here that I'm like, this is a real family or like it feels like one. I didn't take that at all like that. I did. I because he was like book money, and no, then he for, took her with them for Bo. He's no, like, I, I know you're coming with me. I know, but it, it kind of felt like I have to take care of you because he's not. I mean, that's one way to look at it. Because he's already like you said, he's trying to sweep stuff under the rug and just you know. And then like you said, he's having to step up and take care of her. So I was like, damn. I was like, he's not even letting her go with with uh dad he's like just just come with me dude i saw it as uh firstly his relationship with graham is dog shit yeah oh, it's because bad. it's just oh, like yeah. book money well that's what i'm saying yeah, like yeah. that's tough money please yeah <laughs> <laughs> fucking sapper steams <laughs> but i uh was it john ralphio <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but i thought like you had said like the sweet sibling thing and i kind of took it as like this is a, just such a very lived in family yeah and there's so much here that that's one thing i did see in that featurette is that he said he almost had it when the script was originally written that they didn't go into town at all and he said that it was just going to be focused in the house like night of the living dead right but then them going to town he's like this is the opportunity to give these backstories yeah Yeah, you learn learn so much about yeah. everyone yeah and it's like probably one of the more important sequences in the whole film i agree i that does add another layer to it because it's not like he's like take your sister with you he's just like no she's gonna yeah. come with me but see that's why i took it like that because he was like i'm not gonna let you be with this dude he's not paying attention to anything Fuck. you need to come with me Fuck. you know Fuck. what i mean because that's, that's her older brother he yeah. has to take care of her just like he Yikes. did with the dog yeah mm-hmm. and he was like where were you i mean yeah i he still did say need that. to take care of my little sister and I kind of just realized how fucked up it was because it was one of those where were you situations. Yeah. And then the second Meryl comes out of the house, where were Graham's you? like, where yeah. were you? Yeah. It's like, you're their father. Yeah. Dude. I was getting the potato salad. Yeah. I was doing <laughs> what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> Probably what he was told. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Give him a break, man. But Graham watches them leave. And when he turns around, Meryl has already taken off, walking in the other direction. Uh-huh. He calls for his brother to be back for pizza in 15 minutes. In the bookstore, the owners, Mr. and Mrs. Nathan, played by Lanny Flaherty, Dude. the sheriff from Book of Shadows. I The movie that I first know that guy from, he's a very bad man. He's not a good person. I've never <laughs> seen him play a good person. No. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, like, he was like, uh, he's what movie? very, uh, Blood In, Blood Out is That's the present right. movie. It's very bad. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you mentioned that yeah. on Book of Shadows. Oh, no, yeah, he's very bad. Well, yeah. he's he's still angry here. Yeah, he's still yeah, bad. I've never <laughs> seen yeah, him he chill. he's always like, like that. Yeah. I've never seen him be chill. And Mrs. Nathan is played by Marion McCory. They're watching the news and Mr. Nathan comments to Morgan that this is all a hoax to sell soda because he's seen 12 soda commercials so far. Morgan asks for books on extraterrestrials and Mrs. Nathan says they actually did get one by mistake and decided to keep it for the city people. <laughs> what a funny thing, soda. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> He's like, hold on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She gives Morgan directions on where to find it. At the pharmacy, Graham picks up a refill for Morgan's inhaler and has to correct the tech Tracy Abernathy, played by Merritt Weber, when she calls him father. Merritt Weber is kind of killing it these days. Like, she's having a moment. Is she? What's yeah, she Yeah, she's in, like, a ton of shit. She was on, a, I think it was a Netflix original series. She was the main person. She was on The Walking Dead. Oh. Like, That's what, yeah. Okay, Merritt. Yeah. Good for her. Of course, 
playing on the radio in the pharmacy is someone claiming that we're all on the verge of mass hysteria because some people got the idea at the same time to do the same thing. Tracy shuts the radio off and brings the prescription to the counter, but pauses with a deep sigh. She asks him if she can clear her conscience with him, again calling him father. He reminds her that he hasn't been a reverend for six months, but she immediately gets choked up. She's scared about this being the end of the world and begs him to let her clear her conscience. Which, like, how can you say no? Yeah. Plus, six months doesn't seem like... I know he's like, don't call me that. Yeah. But it doesn't seem like that long for anybody to forget. You know no. I mean? Yeah. If, it's kind of fresh. If, especially mm-hmm. this, like, small town yeah. feel. Yeah. And you should still... I mean, even if you're not in that line of work anymore, yeah. you, you can still, still be a, be a good person. neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Listen to... He's like, no, fuck you. Yeah. like, whoa! Give me the goddamn medicine. <laughs> <laughs> In the Army recruitment office, Merrill stares at a poster until Sergeant First Class Cunningham, played by Ted Sutton, interrupts to say he's got it figured out. This guy's a fucking character. Dude, <laughs> he, the way he talks, he to me, I was like, okay, he feels like a throwback to like B-horror sci-fi, yeah. right. like old school, because he's from a different era. Yeah. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> entirely. <laughs> He says that two people have told him that there's been strangers around here the last couple nights and no one can tell what they look like because they're covertly hidden in shadows. That's the giveaway. It's a military procedure called probing. They're just here to evaluate the situation and the level of danger. They have to make sure that things are clear for the rest of them. Merrill's like, you got a pamphlet I can read. <laughs> but what he's saying makes yeah, total I was gonna sense. Say, he's telling it you what's happening. And you dude. saw and you saw yeah. that. Like you saw that at your house. And it's kind of horrifying yes, when you think about it. For oh, the yeah. rest of them? You know what I just realized is like they're kind of giving I mean, whenever something weird happens in the world, mm-hmm. you kind of have like the three groups of people. You got the fucking conspiracy theorists uh-huh. in the bookstore. Mm-hmm. You've got the scared pharmacy worker. Yeah. And then you've got like the fucking military like, intervention. Look, this is what yeah. It is. yeah. That's, I mean, that's legit because I feel like that's another strength of this movie for me is how like pretty realistic it is to how people would be reacting. Cause you Mm -hmm. hear people on the radio like, oh, like calm down. This is all just, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, uh, it's just interesting. Like he really, like it's very astute as far as not just talking about like family stuff, but like societal. Yeah. Yeah. But Cunningham gives him the pamphlet and suddenly he recognizes him as Merrill Hess, the baseball player. Cunningham says that he was there the day Merrill hit the 507 footer and set the record. I don't know anything about baseball, but that sounds like a lot. (laughs) (laughs) He asks if it's still the record and Merrill nods, saying he still has the bat at home on his wall. Cunningham asked, doesn't he have two minor league home run records? And Merrill corrects him, five. When Cunningham asks why he's not in the pros making money and getting his toes licked by beautiful women. But he says it's so weird. <laughs> toes licked by beautiful women. <laughs> it's like, oh Maybe my. that's his thing. <laughs> yeah. No. Just dial down the intensity. Yeah, just no, like a yeah. squeeze. Yeah. Just like just well, the tiniest bit. But everything he says, he's like, <laughs> yeah, well, <it's> shit. Very, <laughs> yeah. You're Meryl Hess. It's like, oh, my God. How do people put up with you day to day? <laughs> they don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do, you empty. Get, yeah. <laughs> do you get people to sign up? <laughs> but like I said, they're interrupted. Lionel Pritchard, played by Michael <laughs> Showalter, says that Meryl has another record, too. Now, I don't know if anybody remember stella yes yeah. but that's all i see and him supposed to be this like street tough that yeah they, they, that is the fucking funniest thing i like laugh every time i see it what's ridiculous is he plays it well he plays it fine but yeah. i just see michael I'm showalter yes. yeah i'm like where's your suit stop it right now. my my actual note is this a comedy now yeah i was like what the fuck is he what doing, are you here? doing here i was here? like what I and I'm literally rewatching Search Party right now. Oh yeah, he is in Search Party. And so Party. to see him, it's just very, very funny to me. I um was expecting a teenager. Yeah, yeah. he's so probably about thirty. <laughs> yeah. Like literally everything about Lionel Pritchard when we meet him subverts what I was expecting. He's got a full five o'clock shadow. <laughs> yeah, because the way he made it sound like they were teenagers, Kids. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, or youngsters. But I was like, that's a grown ass man uh-huh. <laughs> talking to his dad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nope. Lionel was at the movie. Uh-huh. <laughs> and it's sad because it was his last hurrah. He's not on your roof. He's fucking joining yeah. the army. <laughs> 
<laughs> it just it uh, gives me pause every time. But he spills the tea that Merrill has the minor league strikeout record. Lionel says that Merrill is a screw up. He ignored who was pitching or even what the coaches said. He would just swing his bat through the air as hard as he could, earning him more strikeouts than any two players put together. I'm just laughing thinking about the coaches. Merrill, yeah. stop! <laughs> <laughs> Cunningham's like, is that true? Yeah. And Merrill just says, it felt wrong not to swing. Well, yeah. He walks up to Lionel and pulls his fist back quickly, making Lionel flinch, and then he leaves. He should have slapped the shit out of that <laughs> he dude. He should have. Mind your own yeah, fucking business. Yeah, your business, dude. He's like, oh, I've got the tea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were here? Like, literally, I know. It, it seemed empty until he started talking. <laughs> he literally could have waited for Meryl to leave. Yeah. Like, yeah. the whole thing was so unnecessary. That. By the way, that dude fucking sucks. <laughs> 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 I didn't want to be rude, but... but. At the bookstore, Bo tells Mrs. Nathan that the glass of water she's given her is contaminated. When Mrs. Nathan tells Mr. Nathan there's something wrong with their water, Morgan's like, it's fine. Bo just has a thing about her drinking water. He says it's been that way her whole life. It's almost like a tick. A soda commercial comes on and Mr. Nathan angrily yells, 13! (laughs) It was Shasta. Shasta's good, man. (laughs) Morgan brings his book on extraterrestrials up to the counter to buy it. Back at the pharmacy, (laughs) Tracy admits to cussing 37 times last week. Mostly shits and bastards, but she did say the F word a couple times. (laughs) And when she asks if douchebag is a curse, that brings the number from 37 to 71. (laughs) I respect her tally. Yeah. She's like, listen. Keeping track. <laughs> I think this was the first time I ever heard the term douchebag. Really? Yeah. I was like, that's a thing, writing it down. <laughs> right? and- I'll be using that. <laughs> I laughed at the customer leaning in behind Graham. Yeah. <laughs> like, How long are you going to be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's just not working anymore. No. <laughs> and she sat like it's a confessional. Yeah. Well, she needs to get something off her she job. She does. 71. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But Graham arrives late to the pizza place, immediately telling Morgan and Bo not to spend any time alone with Tracy Abernathy. <laughs> <laughs> he looks through the window and sees Ray Reddy, played by M. Night Shyamalan. Why are you guys shaking your head? <laughs> I am. Look, <laughs> I will reserve my comment until later. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, I just got a giggle out of the name. For me, like if I wrote a movie and I'm I'm playing a character, I'm gonna have I'm gonna be like Raven Steel. Like I'm gonna oh, have the fucking God. coolest name, <laughs> Ray Reddy. If your name is Ray Reddy, no offense, I'm sure you're a lovely person, but mm-hmm. that is hilarious. Yeah. Like that is a very funny name. I wouldn't change my name to it. No, <laughs> I wouldn't write uh, yeah. that for no. myself. I, you wrote this. <laughs> that's, <true. laughs> that's what I keep coming back to. Well, in all fairness, he said in that featurette that he had written this character. And then later on decided that he was going to play him. Then change Jeez. the name. <laughs> yeah. No shit. To something Ray just badass. Steel. Yeah. Or, <laughs> Max Power. <laughs> Max no, Power. I don't, I'd go more just normal. Yeah. Like, I don't, <laughs> well, everyone else has a very normal name. <laughs> yeah. Ray Reddy. It just like, it sounds like a, like it'd be like a commercial, like a car salesman or something. Yeah. Or like a garage. Come mm-hmm. Is your get car daddy? Call like Ray that. Reddy. You know what I mean? You already got a slogan I'm, ready. I yeah. mean, hire me, Ray. California um, Charlie sweating. Yeah. <laughs> He's in trouble. But Morgan follows Graham's gaze asking, is that him? Meryl says yes. And they all stare. Ray locks eyes with Graham, but just gets in his vehicle without another word. As he pulls off, Bo asks who he is, but nobody answers her. He peels off. He does. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Asshole. He does. And this what? is another yeah. <laughs> This is another uh instance where like they're all staring. Even yeah. Bo is staring and she doesn't even know what she's looking right. at. And Graham turns away and starts eating his pizza. Like he's mm-hmm. just like, Nope, not like shut it's it out. I'm not cold. dealing with it. Well, <laughs> well, he's like, I've been listening to this girl cuss for like no, 45 yeah. minutes. <laughs> I've earned this. Yeah. <laughs> I why does pizza mostly look like shit on film? Yeah, because <laughs> like, no, it was good. like just a cheese yeah. pizza. So I was like, no, no. It's like, do you get it from a cafeteria? <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, like, M night, you paying for this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, shit. Put the works on that. It's like, look, we blew the budget on building yeah. that house. <laughs> <laughs> why don't we just eat some corn? Yeah. I gotta eat some corn. Meet you at the corn place in 15 minutes. When they pull back up to their house, they hear static, and it's coming from Bo's old baby monitor that Morgan's been carrying around. He tells them that he's going to use it as a walkie-talkie, but suddenly asks if a baby monitor could be catching signals from them because it wasn't working before. 
Graham dismisses this and Meryl says the whole crop circle thing is just a bunch of nerds who have never had a girlfriend making up codes and societies so a bunch of other guys who've never had girlfriends can join in. They do this to feel special but it's all just a scam that nerds have always done. <laughs> Did that feel a little personal? I, or? Yes. <laughs> Graham says it's just static and Morgan can even turn it up to prove it. Morgan does turn it up, but he hears droning, not static. He recognizes it as a code. Bo's like, why can't they get girlfriends? <laughs> <laughs> Morgan hands the monitor over to Graham, who says it's just broken and needs batteries. Meryl laments that this is exactly what the nerds want. He's like pissed off too. Yeah, I was just like, God damn it. <laughs> Fed up. Graham gets out of the car, ignoring Morgan when he says he might lose the signal, but the baby monitor only starts to drone louder. Morgan identifies the sounds as voices, but they're not speaking in English. Bo says that she heard them too, and Graham says they're probably just picking up another baby monitor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, way out here. Sure. Yeah, because you have really close yeah, neighbors. Mm -hmm. And that sounds exactly like a baby. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Graham tries to hand it over the car to Meryl, but it starts to emit warbling and screeching. Morgan tells them to freeze, and clearly shaken, Graham says that this is why they aren't watching TV. People are getting obsessed, and he's letting go of the monitor now. His children both protest, and even Meryl's like, you're going to lose the signal. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly something's happening. Yeah. Yes. He changed his tune. Yeah. <laughs> Morgan climbs up to the roof of the car, saying it's getting clearer the higher they hold it. Morgan holds the monitor up as the rest of the family climbs onto the car. Finally, they can clearly hear a series of clicking and trilling. Morgan says that it's two of them having a conversation, but then it gives way to static again. So on the technical side, I saw on that featurette that this right. sequence was very, very, very hard to shoot because of how much coverage and how many different shots that were involved. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's interesting because he had said that every single script he writes, there's one scene that he loves that always gets the axe. And he was worried that this would be the scene that would be cut out of the film. Uh huh. But to me, it's like so good that it's here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like... I watching it this time. First of all, the sounds on the thing scared the shit out of me as a kid. Yeah, I oh, want to yeah. point that out. Uh huh. But to me, this time around, only when they were all working together did they accomplish right. yeah. something. And so you're getting that theme of family that's running through this whole film. Yeah. And even Graham being a dick in the beginning about it, being like, it's just another baby or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's just another baby. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, but all them being united and together at the end of the yeah. No, it's it's powerful mm -hmm. and the way the camera like follows and yeah. you see right. it and i don't know i just think this is a really excellent sequence and m knight said this is the last time in the film no spoilers or whatever but that this is enjoyable to the family as a mystery uh yeah All right. All right. <laughs> that checks out yeah. <laughs> i i do as well enjoy this uh my first instinct when i heard that would have been to just slap it out of jackson's hand <laughs> like no that's bad um <laughs> But hearing the clicking and all that, I, that and then, like you said, them working together, this is kind of I this is what I have wanted them to do the whole time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then them, like you said, them doing it this time. It's like, look, you're getting something done, dude. Yes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Both of you are holding it and the signal worked. Okay, let's get on the car. Hold on. You know what I mean? Let your Everyone. uncle help you up there. Or yeah, whatever, even, you know? even Bo. Yeah. yeah. And then he picks the little girl after he tells her, you're not climbing on the car. Yeah, then she, he still brings her up. <laughs> well, I like yeah. that he's like, no, don't climb up there. And she's like, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, everybody was up there. <laughs> like, I'm fucking getting yeah. up there. Yeah. Either you're going to be with me or you're going <laughs> to <Yeah. laughs> be against me. <laughs> But that night, Graham brings a bowl of food out to Isabel, who's tied up to her doghouse. The corn sways in the breeze, and Isabel is completely freaking out, trying to get loose and barking in the direction of the corn. Graham stares out into the field in fear, but is brought back to reality when Isabel snaps at him. He finally tells her that she's going to feel real silly when this is all just make-believe. <laughs> I feel like he's talking to himself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Because he's talking to the fear in his brain. Yes. He's like, yeah, you're going to feel real. Isabel. Yeah. <laughs> Dog who can't. Despite this, he slowly takes a flashlight out of his toolbox. And with just the beam of the light, he steps into the cornfield. He, for a second, it looks like he paused and he thought about grabbing something else. Oh. And then he's like, no, no. So I, I feel like at 
at that point was the should I protect myself? This is fake. I'm, you know what I mean. Yeah. He's so trying go. to, yeah, yeah. No, it's no, there's nothing out there because yeah. this is not real. Because he yeah. does grab the flashlight, but like for a very small second, his hand is over the box. Well, because he, he grabs back. It, he grabs it out of his toolbox. So yeah. I'm sure that there's other oh, yeah. shit That's in what, there. And, and I was like, okay, he's still a little like I let me go. I need to see this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? Well, there's like a constant struggle with him as a character. Yeah. yeah. Later on, it's even in the lines that he says where oh, he's no, like yeah. <laughs> back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. So. I it's like really it's ingrained lot. yeah he walks through slowly until he briefly hears the clicking sounds that they heard on the baby monitor see that's enough isn't it oh my god i would oh, fu- yeah. i would piss my shit oh, yeah. <laughs> graham calls out to whoever is out there to stop wasting their time because he's not reporting this to the news or anyone else they're not going to get famous from this having said his piece graham retreats back into the corn in a clear row, he stops to have a look around, but is startled by the clicking sound right next to his ear. Come on. He drops the flashlight, causing it to go out, and the corn begins to move as if someone is traveling through it. Graham gets the flashlight back on just in time to see a leg disappearing into the corn. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is the first moment of fuck. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, yeah. I guess when, uh, Ly- <laughs> when Lionel's jumping around on the roof or whatever, <laughs> but this is like so jarring right mm-hmm. and it's just a fucking piece of a leg <laughs> like, yeah that's literally well, all you see i i don't know how he dropped or why he dropped the light because it went like right next yeah, to his ear but wouldn't you swing the light at it or something you though? probably would i'd drop it for sure oh, no, that <laughs> I would drop a weapon it now and break <laughs> it beyond repair <laughs> <laughs> then you're just stuck in the dark yeah, yeah. Say, running I, through the corn <laughs> i live in the corn <laughs> <laughs> we're corn people now <laughs> i was like first of all the leg that you had said they literally just used a leg model like it wasn't even a person Uh, like it's just incredible it works so well again you're not you're not seeing uh too much yeah and it's just enough to scare the hell out of you i feel like if i remember right the music hits at that point yeah of course and again for people of a certain age very formative moment (laughs) you're like well now i gotta carry that the rest of my life that's fantastic never go into the corn (laughs) what a hell of a wake-up call though huh yeah like that's got you've got to see that undeniable yeah and there's no more hey you know maybe maybe why not not a green leg right (laughs) (laughs) Right, everyone knew he had that right But Graham hauls ass in the opposite direction back to the house, which I did appreciate. Oh, yeah. Back inside, Morgan and Bo play and splash each other while they do the dishes, and Meryl sits reading that army pamphlet. Graham walks in wordlessly and takes a seat at the kitchen table. Everyone notices how badly shaken he is, and they all stare at him. After a deep sigh, Graham finally relents. Okay, let's turn on the TV. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. Yeah. As they turn it on, a reporter says that it first appeared 52 minutes ago and both the U.S. and Mexico City have confirmed that it's not their government in either country. We see about 10 big glowing aircrafts motionlessly suspended in the sky over Mexico City. They were spotted by someone in a plane. They were not picked up by either country's radar. That is scary. Yeah, that's (laughs) scary. Merrill remarks that the nerds were right and Morgan grabs a tape saying that they need to tape this. What nerds? What is he? I don't know. <laughs> the uh, nerds. It's like, uh, very specific about? nerds yeah. <laughs> from his high school, I think. <laughs> Bo snatches the tape away because it's a recording of her ballet recital. Morgan tries to reason with her. Everything that's ever been written in science books is about to change. The future of our history is on TV and they need to record it so that Bo can show her children and prove that she was there. But Bo's like, but my ballet recital. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, I want to show that to my kids. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> he thought she w- he was talking about yeah. her. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's why we're not taping over it. Yes. Right. Without taking his horrified eyes off of the TV, Graham just tells Morgan to get another tape. Morgan finds one, telling Meryl that he's using his tape as he puts in a cassette labeled swimsuit special. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The family sits on the couch staring at the screen as the reporter says that this is a live feed from Mexico City that has not been altered in any way and repeats what Morgan said. Everything they wrote in science books is about to change, causing Morgan to take a puff of his inhaler. (laughs) This I I was thinking because I just watched the episode of BuzzFeed Unsolved where they did the Phoenix lights. Yeah. The M Knight is bringing in like all these different things as far as like extraterrestrials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's making like, I don't want to say the best of like all worlds alien yeah. movie because <laughs> he's like i'll take a little bit of this right. like he's Sprinkle doing yeah right he's like if i'm gonna make an alien movie i'm doing 
And that's it's right, impressive. We're just throwing everything. Right, yes, yeah. all of the above, please. <laughs> uh, th- thinking of this like on a a real level, mm-hmm. I don't even have the words for what how I would. F- I'd be no. terrified and happy all at once. Yeah, because it's it would exciting. be so yeah. exciting. Oh yeah, it'd be very exciting. But then at the same time, you got to be like, get ready to die. So, yeah. <laughs> right. So like, what does this mean though? Like, why are yeah. they here? Yeah, there. And I'm sorry. We suck, people. <laughs> right. So there's no way. Maybe I'm just cynical, the, but there's no way they're no, here for yeah. a good reason. Maybe they're like, listen. They're putting us in fucking. that y'all yeah. have PS fives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. That's, we're out of stock. Yeah. <laughs> so we could just get like a few hundred. Yeah. <laughs> we're gone. Yeah. Right. You won't even know. Or watch here. old Jersey Shore remake. <laughs> yeah. Or reruns. I'm not doing that. We want PS fives. Yeah. So. Yes. But later we see a shot of half full glasses of water littered around the living room. Bo sleeps on Graham and Morgan sleeps on Meryl, but the brothers are both awake, sitting in front of the TV. Meryl whispers to Graham that some people probably think this is the end of the world. He says it like waiting for Graham to say something and Graham doesn't say anything. So he's like, "Uh, do you think it could be? (laughs) Graham's like, yeah. All he wants is just some reassurance. Right. Yeah, no, clearly. From his older brother. Yeah. Yeah, he just needs to be comforted. Yeah. Meryl's upset by this and Graham's like, is that not the answer that you wanted? It's like, God damn, dude. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Meryl asks if Graham could just pretend to be the way that he used to be and give him a little comfort. So Graham explains that there are two groups of people when they experience something lucky. The first group sees it as more than luck or coincidence. It's a sign. Evidence that someone somewhere is looking out for them. The second group just sees it as luck. The people in group two are looking at those lights suspiciously because it isn't a 50 50 situation for them where it could be good or bad. Deep down, they know that no matter what happens, they're on their own and that scares them. But there are also a lot of people in the first group who see those 14 lights and see a miracle. Deep down, they know that no matter what happens, someone will be there to help them. And that gives them hope. So the bottom line is, what kind of person are you? The kind that sees signs and miracles or the kind that thinks that people just get lucky sometimes? And is it possible that there are no coincidences? Meryl listens to all of this, his eyes filled with tears, and he nods in understanding. He tells Graham that he went to a party one time and ended up on the couch with Randa McKinney. He leaned in to kiss her, but realized that he had gum in his mouth. So he stops to take out his gum and turns back toward Randa just in time to see her throw up all over herself. And in that moment, he knew it was a miracle. If not for the gum, he would have been kissing her when she threw up. And that would have scarred him for the rest of his life. (laughs) Meryl laughs, declaring himself as a miracle man and that the lights in the sky are a miracle too. I love that that's his bar for miracles. Yeah. He's like, you know what? I did experience something like that. Yeah, that that would have been gross. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But I read that M. Night said that this scene was the kind of jumping off point. It was the major themes of belief and faith yeah that kind of first of all drive the entire film first yeah mm-hmm. but secondly make this scene so impactful and important and then it gives you these character moments between the two of them especially what's about to come yeah right but it's really kind of the thesis statement for the entire film yeah it's in a, this scene it's such an important scene and it's so well written yes because it's like when Graham was talking i was hanging on every word and being like well, what group am i in? you know what i mean uh-huh. like <laughs> it's it's very it's just so good yeah and w- very well acted right oh yeah but meryl asks what type of man Graham is and Graham's just like do you feel comforted and when meryl says he does Graham tells him then it really doesn't matter he tells his brother that he never told him the last words that Colleen said before they let her die. He says that his wife said, see, and then she said, swing away. Graham says that she said that because the nerve endings were firing in her brain while she was dying, and she played a memory of being at one of Meryl's baseball games. His eyes shiny with tears, he stares at Meryl before telling him that there is no one watching out for them. They're all on their own. The kids are right there, man. Yeah, yeah they are. <laughs> I know they're asleep, <laughs> but, but still. while you're talking, they one of them could have woke up and just been listening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you I was just, like, yeah, I was like, they're right there. We're dying. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing. Well, yeah. like, he, <laughs> hey, don't tell them the truth, man. He gave. <laughs> yeah, I know. You lie to these yeah. kids. He handed Meryl some hope and then just snatched it away, yeah. too. Which I is, feel uh, like just the 
him saying that, oh, it was just nerve endings or whatever, like that hurt already enough. Mm-hmm. And then him being like, there's no one. Okay. No, it's like, you know, that whole speech I gave? Bullshit. We're in group two. <laughs> like, it's like, whoa. Well, I felt very, like it caught me off guard. I remember even as a kid, yeah. because the way he says it, he goes, do you know why she said that? And Meryl's like, yeah. Well, no. he's so, oh. And he's yeah. like, it's because science. He's yeah. like, so wow. we're all dead. Get used to being a corpse. Being dead. <laughs> It's just fucked up that he was like, well, if you're comforted, it doesn't matter. He's like, actually, no. You know what? No, yeah. fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wh- Take it back immediately. <laughs> Whoa. But we cut to Graham driving up to the scene of a horrible accident, still wearing his reverend collar. There are police vehicles and fire trucks and sirens going off. Caroline stands in the middle of the road waving for him to stop. He does, and he gets out of his car. Caroline approaches him and asks what he knows. He says that there was a drunk driving accident, but Caroline stops him. Ray wasn't drunk. He fell asleep at the wheel. Graham asks if Ray's okay, and Caroline says yes, and that that's the first thing Colleen asks, too. Graham takes the fact that Colleen is talking as a good sign and asks what ambulance his wife is in, but Caroline says she's not in an ambulance, father. Yeah, I don't like that. No. No. I had two notes here. The first is that the fact that he asked if he was okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very sad that he cares enough to ask, even in this situation. Yeah. Which says a lot about him as a character. Yeah. Right. And a lot about Colleen as well. Mm-hmm. But also the fact that Caroline, the way that she's been interacting with the Hesses, she was there that yeah. night. Yeah. Yeah. And God damn. That's a lot. Yeah. Very heavy. But Graham wakes up alone on the couch. The TV is gone, but there's a long cord stretching out of the room. He follows it and finds Meryl watching TV in a closet. He tells Graham that it's for the kids' protection. They'd been up watching it since 5 a.m. and they were getting obsessed. <laughs> they should be playing Furry Furry Rabbit or Tea Party. <laughs> Graham's like, what? <laughs> what the fuck is... Yeah. <laughs> and I love how they're getting obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> You're locked in the closet. <laughs> Meryl says that they closed the schools and there have been some developments. After consulting his watch, Graham sees that it's 11 a.m. Meryl points to the same shot as last night, the sky over Mexico City. But now it's daytime and there's nothing visible in the sky. He says they're still there. We just can't see them. A bird flew into where one of the crafts was hovering last night and fell straight down to the ground. Now, I'll accept it here. I do not accept it in Cabin in the Woods. (laughs) The Cabin in the Woods. Yeah, fuck that bird forever. (laughs) But this bird, I'm okay with. Yes. Oh, my God. Can you fucking imagine seeing that? No. No. And you want to know something ridiculous is I don't even have kids, but the fact that I heard they closed the schools is extra frightening to me for some reason. Because even they're like, no, we need, we're all going to (laughs) die soon. So you don't want your kids out of the house. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Stay together. Yeah. But Meryl says that it looks like the bird flew into a wall and they found it and its skull was caved in. They're presuming that the crafts are still there, just hidden with an optical illusion. And that there are more of them now. Graham leaves, but Meryl just continues to tell what he's seen, just talking louder now that his brother's gone. They think that the crop circles could be a type of visual landmark or map to help them navigate and coordinate with each other. After a shower, Graham hears Morgan ask Bo if she wants to hear a story. He goes over to their room to find them sitting on Bo's bed, reading Morgan's new extraterrestrial books with pointy tinfoil hats on their heads. Looking like a couple of Hershey's Kisses. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the thing with Meryl is that the more that it continues, it's just getting scarier and scarier. Yeah. yeah. And it's to a point, I'm glad that Graham is not still attempting to... Like sequester it. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. they got... I mean, this is to a point where we're probably going to have to deal with this soon. We need to be informed. Yeah. The, <laughs> there is no putting this in a box. No, like, no, no. We have to face this. Which, which too, it's still his big brother... Mm-hmm. So yeah. he's still kind of a, he's not a kid, but you know what I mean? You're, to if, his brother. Yeah. 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 There's, I think there's that thing always like with you, you're always going to be my older sister. So even if we're like 60, I'm going to be like, nay, what do you think we, you know, <laughs> like still as if we're like five and seven again. Yeah. But Morgan explains the hat simply. It's so the aliens can't read our minds. Graham's like, okay. <laughs> He sits between his kids as Morgan reads from his already well-worn book, complete with notes and post-its throughout. He says that the aliens would be small, probably his height, because their brains are so developed that there's no further use for physical development, which is very scary. (laughs) Dude, and like you think about evolution and shit? Yeah. Yeah. That's frightening. He says they're also probably vegetarians because of the benefits. When Graham tries to make light of this, Morgan and Bo both snap at him. He apologizes, so Morgan continues... 
one of the scientists that wrote the book says that there are two reasons why the aliens would want to visit us. One is they want to make contact in the spirit of exploration and furtherment of knowledge or they're hostile and they've used up their resources and now they want ours. Graham flips through the book, looking at crude drawings of alien figures. One of them had its neck bent like it had an attitude, and I did appreciate that one. <laughs> I read that M. Knight's daughter drew these aliens oh, for that's the movie. Fantastic. Yeah, that's cool. yeah, and I know that alien you're talking about. Oh, yeah, he's like, mm, he was in the middle child. of some yeah. fucking shit. <laughs> he was reading someone for film, and they captured it. <laughs> But he he stops on a drawing of a UFO shooting red beams at a farmhouse with fire exploding from its windows. He comments that it looks like their house. And we pan down to see three figures, one large and two small, splayed out onto the yard. I probably wouldn't be like, that looks like our house. Yeah, yeah like, what the fuck, dude? And where's Meryl? <laughs> He's dead inside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, now that, I'd be like, all right, that's this is too enough. Much. Yeah, I was like, this is enough. You saw a scary yeah. picture in your picture book. <laughs> <laughs> that's too much. Put it away. The phone rings, scaring everyone. And Graham says everyone just needs to calm down and go eat some fruit or something. <laughs> Graham answers the phone and someone on the other end says father and then there's like a scurrying noise before yeah. the phone hangs up we see like we're looking at him through it looks like a sewing room mm-hmm. yeah which I'm like it's and you, very sad his what yeah there's like a dress on a it's yeah. very sad you see the dress has like measuring tape draped over it uh-huh. yeah. like it's an unfinished project yeah, yeah. she was still working on it it's, it's very sad yeah But Graham rushes to the closet where Meryl still sits and puts on his coat. It's funny because he reaches in and puts on his coat and starts walking away and Meryl's head pops out. (laughs) (laughs) Meryl asks where he's going and Graham says to Ray Reddy's house because he's pretty sure he just called here. And Meryl just stares at him in disbelief. Learning that that was who was on the phone, the shot from the perspective of that room, it's genius. Yeah. Upstairs, Morgan inspects the sky with a telescope and Bo asks if he thinks something bad will happen. Morgan asks her if she's having one of her feelings again and Bo nods and confirms that it's a bad feeling. Morgan says he won't let anything bad happen to her, but she hugs her brother's arm and tells him that she doesn't want him to die. Morgan asks, who said I was going to die? But Bo just stares up at him. Yeah, who said that shit? Like, what They're the going? fuck? Yeah. It's like, tell me explicitly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. who said what. <laughs> and how was I dying? Yeah. <laughs> Be specific. But, but again, this is more, you're in my dream. Yeah. Like, weird, you know. Yeah. But Graham pulls up to Ray Reddy's house and his mailbox identifies him as a veterinarian. Mm-hmm. So there That's it is. That's why he's yeah. like, fuck it, we'll take him to a human doctor. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that just, I was like, oh, he's a vet. Oh, he's yeah. like, it's like I was like, holy shit! I never ever noticed that before. And we've seen this movie like ten thousand times. Yes. This is the first time I caught it. And the fact that he's like, he's not like, I know you don't bring Houdini and Isabel uh, around no yeah. more. Like, like, I, they don't talk about it. No. Like, I just, oh, it just very. I was very impressed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But Graham knocks on the office door, but no one answers. So he peeks through the window to find the office in disarray. When he turns around, he sees Ray Reddy sitting in his vehicle. Now, I should probably just start calling him Ray, but Ray Reddy's just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so good. But it's like it's like John Hamm. You got to say yes. the whole thing. <laughs> but Graham walks over and leans inside the vehicle. Ray is staring straight ahead in a daze, and the entire back of his van is packed up. Graham scans the inside of the vehicle before looking back at Ray and noticing blood on his shirt. He asks what happened, but Ray doesn't exactly answer. He says he wrote down Graham's number to call him, but it's just been sitting next to his phone for six months. But when he knew it was inside the house, in his panic, he couldn't think of any other number to call. He thanks him for coming, calling him father again. He says that he had worked so long that night and he had never fallen asleep driving before then or since then. Graham starts to shake his head in denial, but Ray continues to speak. For most of the ride home, there was no car at all. If he'd fallen asleep then, no one would have been hurt. But it had to be in the right 10 or 15 seconds when he passed her walking. It's like it was meant to be. He finally looks up at Graham and says that if this is the end of the world, then he's screwed. People who kill Reverend's wives don't get into heaven. He starts his vehicle and Graham asks where he's going. Ray says he's going to the lake. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all the pla- <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> all the places marked with crop circles aren't really near water he doesn't think they like water and the <laughs> lake can't be worse than here 
Graham asks if he saw something and Ray says that what he did to Graham made him question his faith and he's truly sorry for what he's done to him and his family. Graham sighs as he fights back a sob and just nods at Ray. Before driving away, Ray tells him not to open his pantry. He found one in there and locked it inside. And then he's just fucking gone. Yeah, he leaves yeah. very abruptly. So I just have a couple things to say. Mm-hmm. As do I. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was like, I can't even get through this without laughing because well, I know uh, we have opinions. I just have a couple of conflicting things. I want to start with the positives, of course. All right. Uh, I did see very sadly the day before they filmed this scene, mm-hmm. M. Night's grandfather passed away. Oh, oh man! That sucks. And so there's a lot of pain in this scene, right? From both sides. Mel Gibson tears me up yes. in this scene every single time. It's very hard to watch. Yeah. And to his credit. M. Knight is not an actor. He's a no, writer-director. Yeah. Right, right. And he plays this part very well. Yeah, he does. Like, I know we talk a lot off mic about a certain favorite director of Mianese yeah. who tends to show up in his films from time to time. And, <laughs> you know, his performance is a hit or miss. Well. He does not. <laughs> Don't fucking Jimmy me, Nay. <laughs> okay? But, and we love Tarantino. Don't take that the wrong way. We but love his work. We love his work. <laughs> <laughs> but... His emotion, everything is played perfectly. Yeah. But I do have to say, the writer of the film (laughs) saying certain (laughs) things that I would deem at this point interesting yeah is a little unfortunate. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like he has a tendency, maybe from signs on, to really put himself as his cameo character, as someone who's like... No, you should probably pay attention yeah. to every word I say. <laughs> it's like he's talking down lens. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I, he doesn't, it's not in the sixth sense. It's not an umbrella. Like, it's no. not, I feel like it's from, he's like, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just a wink. He just winks. <laughs> just keeps doing it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, that's why I'm torn because I think he does a great job. Yeah. No, he does. But the stuff that he says, I think, really should not have been said by the writer of the film. <laughs> So I'm kind of with you. Mm. Uh, I, I I don't feel like he should have said that. Because <laughs> that kind of, I was like, what? Mm-hmm. You know what? I mean, it's just that that's the conclusion. Like that you're watching the same news as us and you're like, none hmm. of those uh-huh. are near water. They're not near water because they're in crops. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't, <laughs> it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> no, um, I don't know. And I was going to make a joke, but now I just felt like an asshole hmm. saying, knowing that he was had a loss in his family. Oh, right. So I was like, oh, well. You're like, never mind. <laughs> yeah. Scratch, yeah. Scratches it out. <laughs> Um, but the other thing is, is, is I do like, like you said, Mel Gibson's, you know, his performance in this scene, but the thing that makes me mad is like him saying, you know, I had to be there. So you're telling me you were meant to kill my fucking wife. Yeah. When he said that, I I was like, like, oh, I would have fucking beat the living shit out of that dude. I feel like that really would have, uh, that's hard. That's hard to, that's hard to, but we do learn something later that may, may be, not have angered him i i but we don't know that yet i no, know that yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just that on its face yeah i would have been very oh, mad. Yeah. i think the difficulty of him hearing that of like no clearly. yeah but i think that from ray's perspective he's trying to make sense of it in his own mind he's like why the fuck did this happen yeah like, right there has never been a time that i've fallen asleep there's never been a time that i was tired enough to fall asleep right she right. just had to be walking there like he's trying to make it make sense no i i get it but that and then being like i don't get into heaven for oh this is a fucking joke dude i don't it's like, think oh no <laughs> it's like oh you got me I think fucked he's up. working on his type yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think jv's just ready to fight right. <laughs> well look i understand like like lord forbid dude like i of course I, but if i had to deal with that i wouldn't change anything your sister has i'd leave everything the way she left it mm-hmm. uh, so i get the room you know what i mean and that too if you're like i was meant to uh, if you say one more fucking word dude i'm gonna pop you in the mouth don't say anything about my wife if it was an accident if it was whatever you know what i mean it's like oh you fucker but that's coming from grief you right. know what i mean yeah because we well, it's know only been six months yeah i was yeah. gonna say we know it's fresh and isn't anger the first step i mean well, sure always i can't mean, remember yeah. well yeah it's <laughs> always like under. It's my first yeah. step. <laughs> that's true and you don't navigate them in order that's no, a lie yeah. by yeah. the way but the other thing is that once he does start talking graham goes 
don't. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, he's already like, I no, might yeah. kick your ass. Yeah. Well, well, and he's like, he had stuff yeah. to say. Yeah. And he needed to say it. But I mean, I think that's the thing as well is that whenever we think of horrible situations like this, there is a lot of pain on the other side. Oh, yeah. That does not get really, I guess, either recognized or thought of right because the other pain is so much yeah and it's like a, larger it's such oh a, yeah it's such a hard position because if he was drunk you'd be like oh you fucking piece of exactly. shit like, yeah, yeah. You, he's he's evil yeah. right but the fact that fuck i'm i was just tired yeah like, I it can, was like, a it's, legit uh, accident he it's, worked yeah. all day it makes yeah. it it makes it like worse because oh, yeah. you don't really have anybody to blame it's just it's sad yeah. it's very it's sad really sad but back at the house still in the closet Meryl is startled awake when a reporter says they have video taken by a 42-year-old man at his son's seventh birthday party in Brazil. Now, everyone, hold on to your tits, okay? <laughs> All opinions are that the video is genuine and what is about to be shown may be disturbing. Meryl scoots his chair up even further to the TV as we see a clip of video that rocked an entire generation. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> The camera comes up behind a group of children gathered at the glass doors inside a house. The party was clearly outside in the yard and it has been abandoned. The children scream and get in the way of the camera as the cameraman zooms in on some trees behind the yard. The kids move to another set of windows as Meryl urges them to move. He's like, vomit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the camera gets a good view of an alley as the kids continue to scream and yell. No. <laughs> They're yelling in Portuguese. They're in Brazil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But one of the boys goes, it's behind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering why. I, yeah. I think it, T, I don't know, some weeks ago was like, why do you say that in English? And I was like, yeah. God damn it. That's, I, don't that, know. I thought the I was like, nobody there. Not one person no. said anything in English. What, uh, what's uh, even funnier is that there were people there that spoke like a different dialect of portuguese i right. guess from portugal and m night took them out because they sounded different than the kids who were speaking portuguese from brazil what? so that was important but yeah this kid going it's, it's behind, behind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and who's he saying that for I don't know. Well, that's for us <laughs> yeah, <I'll be> <laughs> he's like meryl yeah. fucking watch, dude, it's behind <laughs> Which is the way it's behind. <laughs> well, that has come up on very. I don't know why we talk about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how it keeps coming up on other episodes, but we finally. <laughs> <laughs> but this is where it came from. Yes. But we zoom way in on the entrance of the alley, and a green alien just fucking struts by. The kids scream bloody murder and Meryl cries out to backing up into the back of the closet. The footage rewinds and pauses on the alien mid stride. And it is terrifying. This probably was the scariest thing I had seen at this point in my life. Period. <laughs> <laughs> like I was very horrified. And I think it's it's a matter of how they built it up as well. Right. Because the, the news anchor saying, look, this is disturbing. Yeah. When you're a kid, you're like, I'm about to have my mind yeah. warped. Yeah. I mean, we saw the silhouettes at the farm. Right. We saw the floating aircrafts. We saw the leg. This is so... That's a fucking alien yeah. just walking down the street. There's no way around oh, it. Oh, no, it's really cool. It, oh, yeah. it's cool. Oh, man. It just, uh, it rocked my shit. Like yeah. I said earlier, it was the craziest shit I'd ever seen. I think one thing that I hadn't noticed until this time is that while they're screaming, the kids, mm -hmm. there is a shot and you see that the alien's already there. He... Ah! Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. It's like using its camouflage thing in the bushes just yeah. kind of like well, the kids are, waiting. the kids are... Or see it. They followed. Yeah, yeah. They went to another window because they saw it moving. But whenever I was a kid, I thought he was walking, just walking around the house. Yeah. He's and like, like, what? Around this time, he will be walking. Yeah. <laughs> we but, timed it. Yeah, it's behind. It's always, yeah. <laughs> but no, he was there. And the cool thing that I thought was very neat is that this sequence obviously was filmed, I believe, on a set. But it was filmed handheld on a camcorder by M. Night himself. Oh, well. And it works. Of course it works. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's so, it's just so no, good. yeah. And when you talk iconic fucking scenes. Yeah. yeah. Like, this is one of them that'll, that'll stay with me forever. Yeah. yeah. Is behind. <laughs> <laughs> But Graham cautiously enters Ray Reddy's kitchen. He has the pantry barricaded, but there's movement of a shadow that can be seen underneath the door. Graham calls out, but there's no response. Cool as a cucumber, Graham tells it. The police are here, and I'm with them. I'm a police officer. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> He's not good at cursing or lying. No. He says that they know that this is all a hoax, and they just want to talk. 
He continues the charade, even silently chastising himself for using the term paddy wagon. He's like, what the he fuck? Just, <laughs> he just asked for a name and why they did this and they'll get a deal just like everyone else. So this is, again, more of what I'm talking about with M. Night being able to balance humor and fear. Yeah. Right. Because the so this way... this is scary. Yeah, it's horrifying. Yeah. And it's made even more horrifying because the thing is, is that we already start the sequence at Ray Reddy's house. And then we cut back to the Hess farmhouse yeah. to get, get more this. scared. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so we're already primed and we're already even more afraid of whatever Graham is talking to. Yeah. Because we saw the fucking strolling alien on the news. Yeah. Right. This isn't people with boards. This no. Isn't, yeah. Lionel Pritchard's in the it's army. Not- <laughs> <laughs> and the Wolfington brothers are. Yeah. I don't know. They're where they're at. Yeah. But the whole time Graham's talking, the shadow just remains motionless. Graham lowers himself to the floor to peek under the crack in the door. The whole time I'm like, like it's, it's so tense. He sits back up and sees chopped vegetables on the cutting board with a sharp knife lying next to it. So it's like Ray was making dinner yeah. and then was surprised. He looks at his own reflection in the knife before sliding it under the pantry door. We see nothing but canned food and cleaning supplies, causing Graham to put the knife down and walk away. Now, this is what I was talking about at the beginning where I said, I don't think I can handle what is going to be yes. shown. Yeah. <laughs> when, when he's looking through that knife, I'm like, if I please see don't, please don't. Yeah. <laughs> I read in uh, Christ Weekly that when he looked at his reflection in the knife, that's when he knew he had to make the passion of the Christ. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm just fucking. I was like, <laughs> Christ Weekly. Christ <laughs> Weekly. <laughs> I was like. It was just yeah. enough to be real. I was like, did he read that? Yeah. <laughs> that comes out of Texas. You know it does. Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> But he stops himself and goes back into the kitchen, quickly picking up the knife and sliding it back under the door. Immediately, a vaguely human hand reaches out toward Graham's face. In a moment of panic, he chops the fingers off of the hand and both Graham and the creature scream. Hundreds of birds fly away at the sound. Yes, it's it's quite a fucking yes. moment. Ah, it's all <laughs> echoing. I did want to call out because I watched on a featurette. That hand, I I was very surprised by this. Uh The hand is an animatronic. Oh, nice. What? Yeah. And then the shot of the fingers actually getting cut off. Yeah. That's CG. Yeah. No, M. Knight doesn't like CG. Yeah, well, he liked it right here. (laughs) (laughs) They they said the knife wasn't even real in that shot. Uh, Oh, well, I wouldn't have guessed it, though. It's good, though. It happened so fast, I think, is what it is. And the other thing that was very interesting to me is that they said that they would shoot this sequence. They shot it over the course of three weeks. Damn. They said they shot it one shot at a time because this was their little breakaway for whenever the kids had to leave. They had to go oh, home. All right, all right. Yeah. Child labor laws are real and right. we should <laughs> respect them. But it's seamless because it seems like it was all shot at the same time on the same day. Yeah, yeah. no, it really does. I just feel like it all happened so quickly that you don't even really have time to react or like process what's happening right. until you get that break where the birds are flying away and you're just like he just fucking cut an yeah. alien's face. Like, <laughs> it's so it's, mm-hmm. it just happens so quickly and it's made worse because it's so claustrophobic oh yeah there's yeah. like what is it like a little thing behind him to where yeah. you can't even yeah. yeah it's just too much oh yeah it's a lot but shaken Graham returns home and locks the doors behind him he sees morgan and Bo sitting on the couch with meryl between them all of them wearing pointy tinfoil hats <laughs> Graham doesn't even say a word. He just sits down on the stairs. Meryl tells him that their skin changes colors. That's why they couldn't see them that night when they were outside. Graham asks Morgan if his book says what would happen if the aliens were, in fact, hostile. Morgan's like, oh, yeah, they would invade and use hand-to-hand combat because using technology or fighting while in the air would force us to use nuclear weapons and then the planet would be useless. Graham's like, that's ridiculous, what else did it say? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the struggle I'm yes. talking about. <laughs> Morgan says that there are one of two outcomes. The first is that they're defeated and they return later hundreds or thousands of years in the future or they win. Meryl's like, what book is this? <laughs> Graham says that he heard a theory that they don't like places near water, but Mm. Morgan's like, that sounds made up. (laughs) Yes, yes, it does. (laughs) Graham finally walks over to them and confesses that he saw one of them at Ray Reddy's house and got the feeling that it wanted to harm him. He says that they can either pack up and go to the lake or they can stay here and wait it out. Either way, they'll be together. So he asks for a vote. He and Bo vote for the lake and Meryl and Morgan vote to stay home. Graham is like, my vote counts as two. Because he represents two parents. And Morgan tells him that that's bullshit. 
Morgan says that they don't know anything and he wants to stay here because they lived here with his mom. Graham says that that has nothing to do with anything, but it is enough to make Bo change her vote. And Graham's like, you can't change your vote. (laughs) (laughs) Just making up the rules. rules. (laughs) Morgan calls for another vote to stay home. And even with his two votes, Graham loses. Defeated, Graham says that they're going to board up every window in this house because he's seen that they have trouble with pantry doors. So, first of all, that was bullshit. You can't, it was. Yeah. You can't do that. It was double bullshit. He's like, no, I get two votes. No, you can't yeah. change your <laughs> I also, I mean, personally, I there's no way I can even consider going out. Yeah, um, yeah. especially after... Ha- I, I No. We would be home. Yeah, and that just would be bunker it. down. That's... Um, yeah, that's kind of what I uh, what I thought. I, I was like, I I would probably feel more comfortable just kind of barricading everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. By the same token, though, I can understand the apprehension because not only is there a crop circle like right outside the window, but th- they were here, like he they were said, on our roof. He oh, said yeah. what within a mile of them or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I I mean I get it, but I mean you're also home. You know, this is yeah. Your, I think I would know. definitely just want to stay home, but I get why that is still very risky yeah well there's no good decision no (laughs) yeah (laughs) but later outside merrill is very suspicious of the corn blowing in the wind he throws something out into the field but nothing happens and he goes back inside that night the lights are back over mexico city and there are dozens of them they gather in the closet and watch as a reporter names more cities who are reporting the lights. Morgan reports the number of cities now as 274, but they think it'll be 400 within the hour, and they're all appearing within a mile of the crop circles. Merrill says that they were for navigation. They made a map. He whispers to Graham that that means they're going to be within a mile of them. It's like, yeah, we know, Merrill. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> that made me laugh. Yeah, I was like, do. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. There's a crop circle right outside. <laughs> At the beginning of the film. <laughs> <laughs> Morgan tells Graham that they think that this is going to proceed in attack. He admits that he was wrong. They are hostile. Merrill says that this is just like War of the Worlds. A clearly scared and nervous reporter played by Greg Wood. Remember him from The Sixth Sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Says that people have flocked to churches, synagogues, and temples and asked for God to be with them all. Graham just stares at this in a daze. He leaves, saying that he has to get back to boarding up the windows. Merrill asks if they're okay, and Morgan says that some guy had a sign saying that this is the end of the world. Merrill promises that he won't let anything bad happen to them, and Morgan's like, I wish you were my dad. But Merrill tells him to never say anything like that ever again. Graham takes one more look outside before boarding up the window. Later, Graham's just sitting in a chair staring. Yeah. Merrill comes in and says that there are too many windows in the bedrooms and not enough boards. So Graham says they'll just board up the bedroom doors instead. Morgan asks where they'll sleep and Graham has an answer for everything. They'll all sleep in the family room and they'll tie Isabel up in the garage. Merrill says that he'll make some sandwiches for dinner, but Graham stops him when Bo says that she wants spaghetti. He asks Morgan what he wants, and Morgan wants French toast and mashed potatoes. Merrill wants chicken teriyaki. Graham wants a bacon cheeseburger with extra bacon. Damn. That sounds good. (laughs) We cut to a filthy kitchen and a very unorthodox dinner on a table of everything that everyone asked for. This is, like, cute, but, like, also... He's like, this is our last meal. Yeah, yes. that's kind of what I thought, too. Yeah. I was like, this seems like a last dinner situation. So what What do you want? Yeah. Mm-hmm. French toast and mashed potatoes. Bet. Yeah. Like, yeah. What do you want? Like, fuck it. Yeah, that it's, doesn't even make sense together, yeah. but I'll, I'll make it for you. It's fucking sad. I like, that's all I was thinking as well. And then with the religious context, I was like, well, the Last Supper. Yeah. You know, like there's there's a lot of like really dark yes implications yeah. here because when i was a kid i was like yeah man i mean why not i was but, like what uh, would i have yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now it's like he's like what can i feed my children for the last time yeah. Yeah. like whatever they want what do you want whatever you want it's uh it's very sad but no one is eating and when graham tells them to eat morgan asks if they can say a prayer because Bo had a bad feeling Bo admits that she had a dream graham puts his foot down that they're not saying a prayer and demands that everyone eat Morgan tearfully tells his father that he hates him. Graham's like, well, that's fine. But Morgan's like, you let mom die. Too far. Yeah. 
Graham tells his family that he's not wasting one more moment on prayer. Bo begins to cry and Graham screams at his family to enjoy this meal because no one can stop them from enjoying it. He yells at Bo to stop crying, making both Meryl and Morgan tell him to stop. Graham's like, fine, if they're not going to eat, he's going to have some of everything. Bo continues to sob as Graham takes some of everything and begins to eat and cry. I feel like I would have just prayed. Like, I... Well, th- that's the fear. I get that's it. That's just it, like he doesn't know what to do. I one hundred percent get it. But for them, I understand. I what would you're... just, I would just say it. You don't have to believe it. Just fucking say I, something. I understand what you're saying, but that is way too far for him. Yeah. Where, where he's at. I yeah. I get it. I guess I and, just can't put myself there. And my everything kids are like, that's kind of pray? gone okay. on. I'm, and we've already seen he's sweeping it under the rug. So yeah. he's like terrified. So let's just eat. Let's I just, just feel eat. like Morgan clearly still believes in God. Because even at the beginning, he's like, I think God did it. Yeah. When he saw the he crop was. circle. Yeah. So it's like, my son's already super fucking pissed at me. Right. Like if it makes him feel better to be like oh god thank you and like if we die tonight see you soon right. like why does that i i don't know i feel like <laughs> I would just, yeah. I <laughs> amen <Yeah. laughs> and now eat your french yeah. toast i i my thing is that i i i am non-religious right 100 yeah. percent. but whenever i think of people praying i think of it as like a conversation with god yeah like they're talking to right, god right. and if i am fucking like if i fucking hate somebody that's like inviting them to dinner I'm okay. not going to invite you to the table. But at this <laughs> point, he doesn't fucking hate God. God doesn't exist. Well, that's what he's saying. Right. Yeah. I'm just saying, <laughs> what's the point? I, I I don't know. I'm I'm not religious either, but do I still bow my head at Thanksgiving? Do I? I mean, I still do it. You just do it. You do right. it. For but other it, people sometimes, but I don't know. But I think the Maybe thing I'm is, a sellout. Is that, <laughs> <laughs> like, do it for their benefit. Right? Just make them happy. But he has had a massive crisis of faith that I think right. he took everything that happened in a certain way and the kids did not take it in the way that he took it. Right. Yeah. And so they're asking something of him that it's not he that he's- give. Yeah. He's not incapable. It's just that I physically am not going to do that. I understand. Yeah, I that, just I came to I I the same. I was like, he just lost his fucking wife. I just feel like if it's at the point where you're literally like, this is probably the last time we're ever going to eat together. If that's what he needs in that moment, I well, mean, I don't know. But he's like, what happened the last time I prayed? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying I don't get it. I totally get it. I'm just saying for the kids, man. Like no, your son I know. is. Well, I'm but I can't. Fucking... I couldn't. I'm uh, again. You know, God forbid. But I don't know if six. I don't even know how I would survive after six months of you were gone. Like there's no. And then with the kids, I mean, I get it. I do need to step up and be a dad. But no, it's got. I'm hard. still grieving yeah. that mm-hmm. I just lost my fucking best friend and wife. Yeah. Like there is no. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can try to tend to them, but I'm also dying. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'm lost. It's just sad. No, yeah. it's very sad. But Graham is just eating and crying, <laughs> and Morgan goes over and hugs him, which I felt like was huge. Yeah. Yeah. Bo joins the hug, and Graham drags Meryl into it because wow. Meryl's just fucking sitting there. This scene, of course, we've kind of touched on it a lot, but this is just very hard to watch. It yeah. is. Just genuinely. I feel like it's another example of M. Night balancing these tones because you have, it's so well acted, well paced. Mm-hmm. Your heart is broken watching this. Yeah. And then he pulls Marilyn. You get that you moment get of little, relief. Yeah. 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 There's like a small bit of relief. They had said that they had filmed it kind of like one shot per character. And so the first actor to perform this portion right. was Abigail Breslin. And so she had cried on command so well. And uh-huh. she does really, it's yeah. so fucking sad. They said there like wasn't a dry eye in the house. Oh. Of course. And so they went to Rory Culkin because he was so emotionally affected by what he just saw. Yeah. And they were just boom, boom, getting all them done. All right. And able to use like real emotion right yeah like they just i think this is again it takes it to another level yes right. and once more maybe just for people of a certain age an iconic scene yeah yeah but they all hold each other until the baby monitor at the end of the table begins to hum and click graham goes to check the tv in the closet but the news is off the air he says that it's happening Meryl continues boarding up the bedroom doors as graham looks out of one of the windows he backs away from it in horror closes the bedroom door and helps Meryl board it up. I did read, I don't know if I read it somewhere or watched it on something, I don't know, but 
they were gonna have a shot of like them coming up to the house. Oh uh-huh. fuck! But they said M Night said that he found it scarier to just see Graham's reaction to it yeah. and being like, "Let's fucking board this right, up." Right. See, that's Hitchcock. Uh, yeah, I feel like it's that's definitely more effective right. mm-hmm. because I mean it's two thousand two. What would that really look like? Yeah. It might take you out of it. You know what I mean? <laughs> I feel like him being like, fu- I mean, and not even saying a word, just right, like, look, right. we, we have to board this up. That it is, is much scarier. scarier. Yeah. yeah. But Bo and Morgan watch from next to a boarded up window. When Graham notices them, he asks if he ever told Bo what everyone said when she was born. He tells her story. She didn't even cry. She just opened her eyes and looked around the room. Everyone gasped at how big and beautiful her eyes were. They said she was an angel and that they never saw a baby so beautiful. And he tells her that she smiled at him. They say that babies can't smile like that, but he knows that she did. Bo hugs him and he carries her downstairs as Meryl places a board over our view and hammers it up. This is the story of one of M. Knight's daughters being born. Oh, that's adorable. Yeah. <laughs> downstairs, they hear barking outside and Morgan says that they forgot about Isabel. God damn it. I know. Why? First of all, why is this dog still outside to begin yeah. with? I know. And don't tie her up in the fucking garage. Bring her in the house. <laughs> well, but they're also scared because Houdini tried to kill Bo. Yeah, but Isabel's all right. Yeah, I was gonna say the other dog <laughs> she, didn't act. She just weird. snapped at Graham though when he was trying to when he was he. Yeah. <laughs> she, she had was, bad vibes. Yeah, she, <laughs> <laughs> she knew. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dogs always know. Yeah, man. They listen as the barking turns to growling, then whimpering, then nothing. The wind chimes begin to sing and Meryl asks if they should turn out the lights. But Graham's like, they already know we're here. Yeah. They hear footsteps go around the house and see shadows move through the boards and the windows. They're startled by a loud thud at the back door and then a louder one at the front door. Morgan calls out to his father and Graham kneels down to Morgan and begins to tell him about his birth. His mother kept bleeding after he was born, so the doctors rushed him away before Graham could even see him. Merrill reports that they're on the roof now, but Graham gets Morgan's attention back to him. When they were fixing his mother up, she only asked about Morgan. Glass breaks upstairs and Merrill's like, they're in the house. Graham says that he wanted Morgan's mom to be the first to see him because she had dreamed of him her entire life. When she felt better, they brought him in and she held him and they just stared at each other. She said, hello, Morgan, I'm your mama and you look just how I dreamed. Morgan begins to cry. And this, again, was a true story from M. Night's child being born. Look, I'm not a parent, Uh but both of these stories like brought tears to my eyes. I think it's just the way that he's, it seems like he's finally stepping up and he's being what they need. Right, yeah. right. And it took the whole movie for him to do it, to stop denying everything yeah. Yeah. and just be this comforting presence. There is a deleted scene where he brings up a story from him and Meryl's past when they were children. Uh huh. I think he, I guess, wrenched uh, Meryl's arm and accidentally pulled it out of its socket and they had to go to the hospital. And then after he was like all crying or whatever. And then Graham comforted him and it was like a very loving right, moment. Right. And then they're about to head downstairs and he stops Meryl and he goes, I'm really sorry about your arm. And it was just like a very sincere, like it's what everybody needs. I wish right, we right. could have gotten that because all we get of him comforting Meryl is him being like, psych bitch, ain't nobody out there. <laughs> like I, I, that would have been really nice because I know that his kids need it more, mm-hmm. but Meryl is doing the fucking best he, he can. is right. like and still getting blamed when you're not around uh-huh. your kid, you know <laughs> and the whole time we see meryl is honestly going through it yeah. yeah he had a dream that has been dashed yeah he's living a life he's unsure of the direction of his he's life thinking about going into the army yeah right. i mean it's and so to have your older brother kind of i guess be that thing it would mean a lot right now right, yeah right I, I really wish that that had been left in. It was very sweet. But uh, this is, I think there's four <laughs> or five times that like my eyes welled up in this film. Yeah. <laughs> and, no, uh, it's, yeah. it's very emotional. <laughs> I will say that. The, the, though I did like this movie, I don't think it, it hit me very much, except for one part. But I mean, like I thought too, I was like, man, there's a lot of parent stuff in here. I was like, because usually that's all it takes. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But it didn't. I don't know what it was. I it was, got I th- me. I think it was because I was sitting here like, oh, shit, where's the aliens? What's <laughs> <guy?"> <laughs> well, I feel like it's this dichotomy of right. him trying to comfort them and then the glass breaking and yeah. Meryl's oh, yeah, like, they're here. Yeah, like, no, I yeah. mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's very... It's like, hurry, dude, hurry. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's very tense. And then did you see they had one board on the front door? 
Yes, yeah, they, they could have done better. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, dude, uh, instead of telling them stories, you should be more they, telling them stories. They ran out of boards. Yeah, they. that's all they could do. All right. Well, I probably would have started with the front may, yeah. <laughs> door. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> Fucking <laughs> aliens don't know what the front door is. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, like, just pick a door, any door. <laughs> but I do also want to commend, again, the sound design of all these noises. Yeah. yeah. The fact that, again, we do not imagine how much this would have been ruined if we see some fucking aliens banging yeah. on the front door. <laughs> like, this or is... climbing in the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just the way it's done is perfect. And with the music, too. Yes. Right. It's tense as fuck. What if he was like a Billy Loomis alien climbing <laughs> in the top window? Close like, call. Yeah. <laughs> The aliens like who would you settle for a PG thing? Yeah. <laughs> That's why they tore what down the trellis. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but they look upstairs and realize that they did not board up the attic door. Like you were mad at the one board. There's no boards on the attic. Yeah. <laughs> the kids are literally shaking with fear as they pull them away toward the basement. Like they look fucking terrified. Mm-hmm. But Morgan sees a hand reach up from underneath the front door. There's no air staying in that house. Air? Yeah, it's not going to keep temperature when you turn the AC on. That big oh, ass gap under the door. <laughs> it's a full ass yeah. alien. We're hand. like, we're scared of the alien. And John Paul's like, I'm never going to financially recover from this. <laughs> he touched his thermostat. It's like, <laughs> it's like, this is a real horror yeah. movie. Yeah. <laughs> that bill. the alien. Yeah. <laughs> But as Graham looks for something to wedge under the basement doorknob, Morgan stands in the shadows and laments that they forgot their tinfoil helmets. And now the aliens are going to be able to read their minds. Graham's like, you're scaring your sister. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Bo says that she's already scared. Suddenly, he hears the clicking on the other side of the door and calls Meryl over. But Meryl thinks he's just urging him to find something for the doorknob. Graham stands guard over the door and then the doorknob begins to turn. Graham grabs it to hold it straight. And we see him in slow motion for just a second. And something like seems to click inside of him. Mm-hmm. He says, I'm not ready. He calls out for his brother just as Meryl finds an axe to wedge under the knob, but he grabs it off the shelf and immediately hits the one bare bulb that's doing its best to light up the basement. <laughs> yeah. And this leaves the entire room pitch black. I think that, first of all, that's one of the most emotional moments of the film. Yes. To me, because I know that what has been going on over these six months, mm-hmm. he's probably been wishing for death. Or yeah. just waiting to die. And yeah. the fact that in this moment when it's about to happen, he's like, fuck yeah Yeah. no that's not what i want we hear thumping in the darkness until morgan finally finds a flashlight and turns it on he shines it around the room and we see meryl and graham holding the door closed with the axe wedged underneath the knob graham asks where Bo is and morgan finds her with his flashlight and she reassures him that she's okay Meryl finds an old radio, but gets no reception as he dials through. He asks what's happening out there, and Morgan says he hopes they're all doing better than them because they don't even have helmets. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, we get it, all right? We got the helmets. We got the fucking helmets. I do love the way that they use the flashlight. Yes. Yeah. Like it feels, I don't know. It's just the way it's revealing everything as they continue. It feels immersive. Right. Yeah. And again, we talked about it earlier, but it's more of like in this scene, especially in the basement, it's more of what you don't see. Yes. It's just like super effective. There's pounding at the door. But when Graham goes over to investigate, he realizes that they're not actually trying to get in. They're only making noises. Which is terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Meryl says they must want their attention on the door. This is all just a distraction. Morgan says that the book says they're very good problem solvers and they will find a way to get in. It's like, Morgan, (laughs) Morgan, can you just hang tight? Your sister is horrified. (laughs) (laughs) When asked for it, Morgan hands the flashlight over to Graham, who says that there's a coal chute somewhere in the basement. They go off in search of it. Following a breeze, Meryl and Graham meet in the middle of the back wall of the basement and find the coal chute, along with Morgan standing right in front of it. They freeze and stare at him. And when he asks, what? An alien hand that was camouflaged as the chute grabs him. And that hand was there. It's yes. there the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> it's I was frightening, like, no! dude. Yeah. <laughs> Our view is only on the dropped flashlight on the ground as Meryl and Graham kick up dust and dirt trying to rescue Morgan. The flashlight is kicked away and Bo picks it up. She reveals Meryl piling bags of dog food along with one loose can for good measure (laughs) over the coal chute. 
I love the flashlight bit on the ground. Yes. Mm-hmm. Such an interesting choice to do yeah. that. Right. And again, with the balancing of tone, because that one can is hilarious. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, fuck that. Yeah. We're using well, everything. He looks like he wants to laugh and then quickly <laughs> composes himself. He does, yeah. Uh, and why is uh, the little girl hiding in the corner all Blair Witch style? <laughs> She's scared. <laughs> yeah, but I was like, what the hell is going We're on? Like, turn around. Yeah. yeah do not. <laughs> Meryl picks up a flashlight and shines it on Graham. Morgan sits in his lap, struggling to breathe as he's being overtaken by an asthma attack. Graham tells Meryl that they didn't bring Morgan's medicine. Meryl stares in horror as Graham tells his son not to be afraid and tries to guide him through his asthma attack and help him breathe. Bo says that this is what she dreamed. Why didn't you tell anybody? Yeah. Right. Let's don't forget Morgan's yeah. <laughs> Not that this is all your fault. It's I'm not just, blaming you. All tiny. Yeah, like, like, oh fuck, that's right. Yeah. yeah. This Asthma. is what was gonna happen. This was a little hard to watch because oh. I've never had to go through this, but I can't even imagine. Like no. that would be mm. fucking. It's, incre- terrifying. it's incredibly yeah. hard to watch. And I mean, imagine not even from Morgan's perspective, but no. Graham's as yeah. well. Like, good lord. Graham cries as he continues to hold Morgan, who is still gasping for air. He begs, don't do this to me again before growling, I hate you, which (laughs) I'm like, is this really what Morgan needs to hear? I know (laughs) he's talking to Morgan, but well like, poor morgan if he's yeah. thinking that he's, he's like, like dude i'm trying my best <laughs> i didn't even mean that shit i said earlier <laughs> he's like you said you hate me well <laughs> oh, i hate you no but i mean this is basically what's been boiling underneath yes, the surface yes. the whole film and he finally puts words to it yeah but he continues to coach his son as Marilyn Bo cry and watch Merrill looks full of hope as he whispers a prayer Morgan loosens his grip on his father as he begins to breathe more normally and Graham cries in relief. Meryl says that they should save the flashlights and they turn them off, leaving the basement in darkness again. What a goddamn sequence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I feel like we're all speechless. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) As if we just watched it again. (laughs) That was a bold retelling, man. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Back at the night of the accident, Graham pulls up to Caroline, who stands in the middle of the road, flagging him down. They're in the middle of the road talking again as she explains to Graham that Ray went off the road and hit Colleen, then hit a tree, and she was pinned between that tree and his vehicle. Graham asks what that means, and Caroline says that the truck severed most of her bottom half and she can't be saved. Her body is pinned in a way that's keeping her alive when she shouldn't be. The truck is literally holding her body together. Caroline says that she doesn't feel a lot and she is talking. So they left her there so Graham could be with her while she's still awake, but she won't be awake for long. She asks if Graham understands what he's been told. And Graham asks her if this is the last time he's going to be able to talk to his wife. Caroline cries as she tells him, yes, it is. Graham passes the paramedics who look at him with sympathy and Ray Reddy sitting on the ground who is unable to look up at him at all. Graham wakes back up in the basement the next morning to the sound of the radio playing. He opens his eyes to see that Meryl found light bulbs and the basement has light again. The voice on the radio says that they didn't come here for the planet. This is a raid and they came here to harvest us. We're all just lucky that they're leaving. Graham brightens up at the news that they're leaving and Meryl tells him that he's been asleep for about 12 hours. (laughs) Damn. He's fucking tired. (laughs) It's been a rough couple days. That's another thing. Dude, you're right. (laughs) This only this is like a couple days. (laughs) He says that they're reporting that the aliens had poison gas that they're able to secrete in small amounts and that a lot of people died. They left quickly this morning like they were scared away, but some of their wounded were left behind. Like they're just like, fuck it, let's go. Yeah. Well, I guess they got the rest. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Meryl proposes that everything has a weakness and people must have found a way to beat them. He asks Graham if he thought they would make it through the night and Graham says no. Meryl tells him that there are some things that he just can't take. And one of them is his older brother, who is everything he wants to be, losing faith in things. He says that he saw Graham's eyes last night and he never wants to see his eyes like that again. Graham agrees. They look over at Morgan, who is asleep but wheezing. And Meryl says that he's been that way for a while. He still needs medicine. Graham says that if he has another attack right now, but he doesn't need to finish his sentence. Meryl knows. Mm Mm-hmm. Graham takes the baby monitor out of Morgan's pocket. And when there's nothing but static, they both agree that that's a good enough sign for them to go upstairs. I got to be honest. I know that we have to go upstairs. Yeah. Yeah. Like this is an imperative. 
I would be scared shitless. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, but you you got to go. You have to. Yeah. I mean, but it would be the worst thing I ever did. Yeah. <laughs> that, that pickaxe we used to hold the door is going Fair. Absolutely. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. Meryl goes up first and nods to Graham that the coast is clear. He comes up carrying Morgan and tells Meryl to get his EpiPen too in case he needs it. He lays Morgan out on the couch and looks over at Bo, who's showing him the victory dance that people are <laughs> yeah. doing on TV. <laughs> He asks Morgan if he wants to see two and Morgan nods. So Graham goes to the closet to bring the TV back and we follow him before we fucking lose our shit. Yeah. Uh-huh. They had said on the TV that in the Middle East, they had found a primitive method of defeating the aliens, yeah. but they don't say what it is. Of course uh. not. So it's very interesting. <laughs> As Graham wheels the TV back over, we see in the reflection of it that there is an alien standing by the window. Meryl comes in, dropping the syringes. The alien is holding Morgan's limp body and looking around with its wrist poised above Morgan's face. Graham tells Meryl to wait as the alien begins to click. We zoom in on its hand and we see a couple things. Mm -hmm. His hand is turning into the pattern of Morgan's shirt. And judging by its missing fingers, this is the alien that Graham was scrapping with at Ray Reddy's house. <laughs> so he got out and was like, I'm fucking coming yeah. back. coming for that ass. Yeah. 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 personal. Right? Well, he took some fingers. Yes. Yeah. Well, they can't grow back. I don't know what aliens yeah. do. For, like, I'm just wandering around. They, I get locked in a fucking pit. Like, this yeah. is just insult. He's like, I was just on the- recon, dude. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the vegetables smelled good. Yeah. I was just like, fuck. Can't play games no more. Mm-hmm. How's he supposed to drive? What, what happened? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. What his, it's going to be really tough well, going that's, forward. Uh, that's why they left him behind. Man. That's me. First of yeah. all, that's, I know. <laughs> fuck the other aliens <laughs> for that. fucked up. Things happen, <laughs> man. Life is tricky sometimes. I did want to touch on how they did this, though. Uh huh. They actually had the only things that were actually on set at the time. Right. They have Rory Culkin on wires. Uh huh. And they have a false fake hand that's holding his torso. Okay. Everything else was done later. What? Yeah. Oh, nice. They did motion capture. They had a guy in a blue suit as the alien. Oh, all right. And then they splice it into the scene later. Okay. You can't tell. You cannot no. tell. Yeah, that looks, looks good. It looks really good. In 2002. Yeah, that looks real good yeah mm-hmm. but i'm kind of doubting it because m night does not like cg well so. maybe <laughs> <laughs> i think they got in a really yeah. late <laughs> put out a casting call yeah, yeah they kind of the fingers off. Off. And, uh, <laughs> outside philly right. or? you gotta be we really are. committed wait they actually yeah. cut his fingers you off? have to be right. committed we're gonna have to cut a couple of your fingers <laughs> off it's like all right cool. just part of it yeah. yeah i've always wanted to be famous so. yeah right. <laughs> like, how comfortable are you with heavy machinery <laughs> Love loves it, it. yeah <laughs> But we re- we put it together because we see the cutoff fingers, but we get a flashback of yeah. it, which I feel like we didn't need. But no, fair. Everyone stares in fear and disbelief, and Graham lets his mind wander back to the night of the accident. I'd be like, "No, Dad, stay here." <laughs> <laughs> just his eyes go white. Yeah, he's just warging out. <laughs> But Graham finally gets to his wife, Colleen, played by Patricia Callenberg, who tells him that she was just taking a walk before dinner and it was just meant to be. See? This is the only thing that I think got Ray Reddy saved from and getting beaten. his teeth knocked yeah. out. Yeah. Because that's exactly what she said. Mm-hmm. And there's no way he could have heard that either. Yeah. No. He asks if she's in pain and still lying pinned between the vehicle and the tree. She tells Graham that she doesn't feel much. She begins to cry as she gives him messages for the family. Tell Morgan that it's okay to be silly. Tell Bo to listen to her brother because he'll always take care of her. And tell Graham to see. And she says, tell Graham. Mm -hmm. She's talking to Graham. Yeah. And tell Meryl to swing away. Just after she says this, she slips away. I think that for whatever reason, when Graham told the story Mm -hmm. earlier, that's not how it happened. Not at all. Yeah. I think he just didn't want to see. No, not at all. Yeah, because he doesn't he doesn't say that she was telling anyone specifically. Yeah. No. She, he makes it sound like she's just like, see, swing away. Yeah. Like yeah. just saying and shit. He <laughs> clearly did not tell Morgan it's okay to be silly because yeah. No <laughs> <laughs> Morgan's not silly. No. Uh this was tough. This was a little rough for it's me. Yes. Heartbreaking. Uh, again, it's it it hits and it's like fuck. Mm-hmm. But I I I would be devastated. Like mm-hmm. there is no words for you know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's a lot. It's like powerful too, because this is the first time we're seeing her and she's, yeah. she has such a presence yeah, over right. the family and o- really over the whole film that it's just like, we've been inching closer to her this whole time. And mm-hmm. now we're finally here and it is devastating. Yeah. Like it's horrible. Like you get 
everything that you're like man he's kind of that's rude yeah. okay they're calling you father out of habit like no you get it now yeah like, him having to live through this moment you get it and it was set up enough through these flashbacks yeah oh yeah you knew it was going to be bad but it's even worse yeah when it actually comes yeah yeah one thing I did see on the featurette is that M. Knight said that this scene was not only the first scene that was filmed in the entire film. Oh, my film, God. Because oh, wow. they filmed it chronologically, like, legitimately. Oh, oh, all right, all right. You know, so you have this memory in the past. Yeah. But this scene was filmed on September 12th, 2001. Oh, my God. Damn. Yes. And so he had said that they had done, like, a candlelight vigil in, like, a little circle and, like, kind of... Jesus right, Christ. Right, right. ...were there in the moment, and then emotions are already very high yep. yeah yeah and then mel gibson gets to set and everybody is already on like pins and needles with these emotions right and they use that and you can feel oh yeah like yeah. it just this scene is amazing that's a lot but we flash back to graham and meryl on the couch graham asking his brother what kind of person he is the kind that sees signs and miracles or the kind that believe that people just get lucky is it possible that there are no coincidences Back in the present moment, Graham looks over at his brother and the record setting bat hung up on the wall behind him. He tells him, swing away, Meryl. Meryl, swing away. It finally clicks and Meryl grabs the bat off the wall. The alien does not appreciate this and <laughs> blows gas from its wrist into Morgan's face. <laughs> I just, I'm sorry, but it's crazy to me that the alien took that as a threat. Yeah. It's like, well, oh, it is you're swearing up. Yeah, it's <laughs> bad. <laughs> Bo screams and we see her being duplicated in the skin on the alien's back. It's unbelievable. Yeah. That was the other thing is that whenever he ha was holding the wrist over yeah. him, yeah. you could see Graham's face yes. through yeah, it. Yeah. Like their skin is neat, man. Yeah. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Meryl proceeds to whoop the alien's monkey ass, <laughs> causing him to drop Morgan. Graham picks up Morgan and the EpiPens. Meryl hits the alien again and a glass of water spills on it as it hits the floor. The alien's skin begins to melt away where the water hit it. Praise be to Bo, who has left dozens of glasses of water all around the living room. This, again, every, like, I know that a lot of people hate this. A lot mm -hmm. of people hate this. But it's only been set up the entire film. Yeah. First of all. Second of all, this idea again with religion of holy water, water being a purification thing, mm -hmm. them talking on the television about primitive methods. Yeah. You know, it all, it just, it works and it's brilliant, I think. I do too. I'm a little surprised because I feel like you would be the person that'd be like, fucking water no yeah. dude i know that i come off as an <laughs> asshole from time to time but all i'm trying to say is that first the th i think that's the thing as well with the aliens being hostile uh -huh. they are desperate yeah. right everybody's like well why would they come to a fucking planet where water is like 80 what i don't know science yeah but <laughs> but it's because they're ray, desperate right ray right. ready did say he did that go the water. See, that's an issue <laughs> yeah that's what hurts this for me yeah is, is that. him saying that because you that. if they would have just been there then it would have just been like oh shit mm -hmm. you know she knew something but you already fucking told us <laughs> that water is what's gonna hurt them so it's like ugh. he said they don't like water. No, he didn't. <laughs> like, he said I don't water think kills they them. Like it. Yeah. <laughs> Rewind it. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, and I know your daughter leaves a lot of glasses. Yeah, so. <laughs> but Graham takes the kids outside, and Bo watches from the window as Meryl hits glasses of water, and the alien hisses as it hits it. We see from the alien's point of view as Meryl hits it, knocking it over, and glasses of water fall onto its face. I love that POV shot. Yeah. The bat is broken on the ground, and in the reflection of the TV, the alien takes its last breath. Meryl rushes outside where Graham has given Morgan his EpiPen. He's muttering that this is why Morgan had asthma. It's not just luck. His lungs were closed, so no poison got in. Meryl and Bo sob, and Graham just tells them to give Morgan a minute. I didn't really realize until this time. I don't know if I didn't realize it or if I, I don't know, but Morgan looks dead. Yes. Like literally right. dead. He does. And the way that Meryl's reacting to it, like Graham, like he's gone mm -hmm. almost, but Graham's just like, no, stop. But after an agonizing moment of no breathing, Morgan finally speaks up and asks his dad what happened. He asks if someone saved him and Graham sobs saying that, yeah, he thinks someone did. 
We pan through the farmhouse until it's winter now. Snow falls outside and Grandma's getting ready in his bathroom. He steps outside wearing his reverend collar and smiles at the sound of his children laughing. He puts on his coat and he leaves the room and the credits roll. So was he just going for a Johnny Cash look or did he go back to <laughs> church? Back. I mean, I he's, like, he's the man in black. <laughs> yeah, I, was like, What's happening? I read that M. Knight said that the scariest part of this whole film is that a good man could lose his faith. And I think that mad aliens are much scarier. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that alien hissed at him. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I see your point in yeah, that. Yeah, no, I get it. But <laughs> the aliens was scary. Yeah. Yeah. You saw it. It's behind. <laughs> <They're> behind. <laughs> But I have to ask, what did you guys think of Signs? Uh, I I do like the movie. Uh, again, like I said, I don't feel like it's very scary. It does have really good parts to it that are very memorable. Mm-hmm. Um, I the only thing that, like I said, I I don't and I I you know I get it. Whatever I don't like is the my wife died for this my son has asthma because god made him have asthma for the dude please don't kill my wife if that's what it is don't make it a point to kill her because of that just let us let her survive and let us go through this together you know what i mean it kind Mm -hmm. of feels like my wife died to warn me about this for the aliens invading my son has asthma because when the aliens invade it's going to save him i don't give me a god who's doing fucked up shit just for other fucked up shit to happen. But that's the Bible. Yeah, that's uh, literally what... I mean, they, I he killed that dude's whole family just to prove the devil wrong or something, He's right? Like, no, well, watch. He's like, no, watch. No, he loves me, but dude. Your, but your <laughs> argument is Old Testament. That has nothing to do with the New yeah, Testament. Yeah, he tells me that all the... I don't yeah, know. It's the Bible. I, yeah. I, just, I don't know. What it it's a big book. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I do get what you're saying, mm-hmm. but even that sounds crazy. You know what I mean? It's like, come on, what kind of what kind of God would really do that? That sounds nuts. <laughs> no, you know what I mean? Uh, but I, I know it's a small thing, but it is, it's just like, come on, don't do that because then it's like, so every fucked up thing was meant to happen to me for a reason. Yes. You know what I mean? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope not. God Correct. damn. <laughs> well, I, but to me, I think that that kind of speaks to its optimism in a way. And this is again, coming from a cynical pessimist. Right. Cause I fucking, I hate everything and I think everything's the worst thing ever. Right. But I think that that kind of gives people the strength and the power to continue to say, look, this is fucking horrible, right? but maybe it's because of something else. Maybe there's a reason why this is happening because later, you know, I mean, that I, I feel like is the whole thesis of the film is this hopeful optimism and to have faith and belief. No, I get it. But I think that, I mean, I understand your point. Yeah, I just don't, I would hate for something to happen and to be like, well, it, it had to happen for... The, you know, for you to stay alive, it's like no, 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 don't do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, uh, but I, but other than that, I I do like the movie. It's it, like I said, it's uh, it's I know it's a small thing or whatever, but it but that did kind of that, and then the whole water. You uh, know what I mean? The you whole did, water. Did, you, no, him saying oh, that okay. and you didn't okay. need to do that. I don't I don't mind him being in the movies, but it's like don't tell us what's going <laughs> I on. I feel dude. like I would even be okay with him saying I'm going to the lake. Okay, that's and fine. Not saying anything else. And even Graham being like, Well, maybe we should go out to the lake too. Yeah. I feel like it's just that one line yeah, about I don't think they like water. <laughs> Why don't I you think, think that? Yeah. <laughs> why <laughs> that's a great question yeah. i and think if he would have just cut that yeah. then there would be no, i there'd be nothing to say and who's watering those crops they probably <laughs> yeah <still are>. <laughs> what the f- <laughs> i don't know man personally i think that this film is just genuinely so good yeah and I, I i don't know what other word to use outside of brilliant like i think that the way that they use the themes the way that they build the characters mm-hmm. is just so remarkable and I think that you can tell that this was made with such care and attention from someone who was kind of, I mean, you, you say that people are meant for shit. I think he was meant to be a filmmaker. Yeah, no, I think so, too, for sure. I think, I mean, one thing that I will say that kind of bums me out about his whole, I guess, filmography mm-hmm. is that I think that everybody came to every one of his films after the first three, right? maybe even four and we're just like, well, where's what's the twist? Where's the twist? Where is it going to be? What's it going to, you know? And it kind of unfortunately ruined 
a lot of films for a lot of people because they're like, mm -hmm. well, I don't care about the film. That twist wasn't very good. It's yeah. like, well, watch the film for what it is. I get what you're saying. And I'm a person that chases a twist. In. Like I oh, they're great. addicted to And again, I think I'm going to blame dad because <laughs> <laughs> dad's like, what the yeah. fuck, dude? <laughs> When I was young, he showed me The Usual Suspects. Mm. Oh, good movie. And mm -hmm. yeah, it, the ending was a fucking gut punch. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I'm like, that's what I want to be completely blindsided. I want to feel like the rug got pulled out. Like, mm -hmm. I've been chasing that high ever since I watched that movie with him. Yeah. And M. Night, he doesn't always give it to me perfectly, but he gives <laughs> it to me. So I, I mean, I don't know. After the Sixth Sense, and we've talked about this before with Ari Aster or Jordan Peele, when that is your first film, right? It kind of almost feels like you have nowhere to go but down. And so him, he was so fucking consistent that any slip in that people are gonna be like, oh, be, and I fucking lost it. Like I feel like <laughs> he really almost set by being so great, uh -huh. he set himself up to fail. Uh, does that make any sense? No, it makes perfect sense, and it's very unfortunate. Um, you know, I honestly, I wonder if because of all the setup, I mean, is it really a twist ending this? Or is it just a thing that they've been building towards the entire film? Or do we just call it a right. twist ending because Be it's a M. Night film? Yeah. <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. I love this movie a lot. And like I said, the more the older I get, the more I appreciate it. And I am, I know that you didn't really like that aspect of it, but I am that person that's like, okay, this fucking horrible thing happened. But you know what? I bet in two months, this is all going to make sense. Like I'm that person that, and it's probably just like a like a self soothing right, mechanism. Right, right. But mm -hmm. I appreciate literally the worst thing that could have happened happened. But his son is still alive. His kids are still alive. I mean, and I, if they I come back, it. now we know water yeah. hurts them. Like I mean, <laughs> <laughs> get the hoses. That's, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's the way. I I feel like I don't know. Maybe the person I have become or slash and become mm. am becoming or whatever appreciates the confirmation that this may seem dark and horrible today, but in six months, it's all going to make sense. And maybe that thing that happened is still horrible, but there's a reason that it happened. Right. I don't know. There is no justification for some things, but that helps me get through the right. day. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess that can just lead us into ratings. Mm -hmm. And I mean, anything bad i have to say is mostly nitpicky except for that line <laughs> yeah <laughs> that does hurt it a little bit because i feel like if he hadn't said that it would be more of a twist mm -hmm. true and just i mean the rewatchability is so high because once you see how everything plays out you see those moments of him talking about baseball and the glasses of water oh, yeah. and like you said there's a monster kind of a glass of water yeah like it's it's all very it all just leads into itself and we've talked a lot about endings that like you're like oh shit but when you think about it you're like but wait that doesn't make any sense this makes sense this narrative has been the entire film mm -hmm. and it came to a logical conclusion and i know that a lot of people didn't like it <laughs> but again i'm m night you know call me m night because i will do <laughs> i'll do pr i will defend this dude even when his <laughs> movies are shitty <laughs> um i love it and I came to the to the table with the score and I'm going to add 0. 0.5 because I feel like I just had a really fun time talking about it. And it's just such a great film that has weirdly aged really well. Yeah. Because if you look at a lot of movies that came out around this time, they don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> I do appreciate that. And um, I'm just very thankful and excited that we finally got to cover one of his movies. Mm -hmm. And that it is this movie because it's so good. So yeah. thank you, Patreon, for for making my dreams come true. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, on a scale from 1 to 10, contaminated glasses of water, I'm going to give signs a whole ass 9.5 contaminated glasses of water. Wow. I really, really love it. And even looking at it critically, because I'm not going to lie, there have been movies that I loved, and then watching them for the show, I'm like, fuck. <laughs> God damn it. Um, it still holds up. I know that it's not perfect. I can't really in good conscience give it a 10. But it's pretty damn close for me. I think it's it's really, really great. And I am thankful that I still feel that way watching it 
at 32. Right. This movie's almost <laughs> fucking 20 years. It is 20 it years is old 20 now. Years old, yeah. Yeah. We're in 2022. Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. No, yeah. For it to still mean something to me watching it for the first time as, as a yeah. teenager. Come on, man. That's <laughs> no, that's yeah. a lot. So I'm 32 years old. Yeah. It's like <laughs> that's that's great. But I I'm going to stop gushing <laughs> and I'll open up the floor. Um that was very generous. <laughs> <laughs> I am night, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um I did enjoy this movie and I'm the opposite. I I believe I'm not saying you don't, but I believe in hope and faith. Like I believe in something. Mm -hmm. Uh, I won't sit here and be like, oh, there's no God or no Buddha or no, what." you know what I mean? Like I do believe there is something, Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, it, I just have a hard time believing that all this bad shit happens for a reason. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I get it. It's a movie and that's the message or whatever, but that kind of, I don't want to say took it. uh, That's, that's for me, what kind of hurt it for me. Cause I I just find it hard to believe that there's so much bad shit going on in the world everywhere and it's for a reason. That's just no, that's, very, that's, fair. that's a very yeah. hard pill to swallow for me. Now, I'm not saying that's what I believe. I'm saying that's the message of the film. Oh, no, no, no. That's what I'm right. saying. Yeah. That's what hurts it for and the movie. And I say movie. that's what yeah. I try to believe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Uh, other than that, it is very good movie. Yeah. It's a very, very good alien movie. Uh, I do enjoy it. Mel Gibson, he sucks, but... <laughs> you know graham he's good yeah uh <laughs> joker joaquin phoenix he's fantastic he's always fantastic uh, mm-hmm. kid from scream four yeah and then <laughs> the what is i zombie or zombie land zombie land uh they're all good <laughs> yeah he's do, like an all-star yeah. cast yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i do like the movie i don't know if i can go that high and i i get it it's not about being the scariest movie but i feel like not having any for me anyway any real horror in the movie like as far as like there is aliens so that is scary but like again i'm i like slashers you know what right. I mean? i'm a simple man <laughs> um not having any kind of which is weird because this is still a weird like supernatural thing yeah but it's i guess because there's no ghosts or monsters or anything i'm just like <laughs> wow this was good but where's the horror which is funny to my head because the i horror know is in brazil sir yeah, yeah. Yes. i was gonna say but the horror is behind because <laughs> behind. In, my, yeah. <laughs> in my head it's like no that's fucking terrifying dude yeah yes. and i know it but again like i said it's hard to separate them you know what i mean mm-hmm. um but for me, I do enjoy this movie, and I w- I this is a movie I would watch still. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not that it's bad, uh, but on a scale from one to ten, contaminated glasses of water, I'm gonna give Signs a seven point five. Hmm. Uh, I like I said, I do enjoy the movie. I will watch it again, but it is a good movie. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I. I hate to say I would have loved the xenomorph to come out and cut his head off because I would have, but it's not that <laughs> that's movie. Not, yeah, yeah is. but that's not what this is. I, I mean, I, I agree with all points made here, right? Positive and negative, because that bit with that line really is a bummer. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I just feel like on the positive side, there's just so much that outweighs and almost allows me to almost forgive that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not enough to give it a perfect 10. Oh yeah. But I think the thing is, is it's that conversation for me because I feel like the conversation between Graham and Meryl in that moment is kind of a conversation I have internally all the time. Yeah. Like I am that cynic and pessimist, but there are times that I'm like, man, what if it would be cool to believe in some kind of hope or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then it's quickly dashed, but (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) But I mean, the thing is, is that that's kind of how we live our lives. Good things happen to us. Bad things happen to us. It's a matter of how much we read into them, how much we let them affect us. Like it's a lot of deep messages in this film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was very surprised to find out that in that interview I read, M Knight doesn't even consider himself to be religious. He, huh. Yeah, he said he's more of a spiritual person. Why did he say that about a good man losing his faith? I yeah. well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, maybe just faith in humanity. Okay, yeah. faith okay. in the world doesn't always have to be religious faith. But I mean, the thing is, is that this is such. It feels like a very spiritual film. And again, it's almost like we talk about the religious horror of like The Exorcist and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. For some reason, non-religious ass me, this for some reason just speaks to me yeah and i do not understand it 
But I just feel like everything is just top notch writing, performances, music, story, cinematography, and it balances so many different tones that just work. And I will admit that nostalgia probably plays a big role. Yeah. Probably. Because to me, there are so many iconic scenes in it, and they might be iconic to me simply because... You saw it so young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. at that formative age. But the thing that surprised me the most about watching it this time is just how deeply emotional it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I did not count on that. And I'm like, am I fucking well enough? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, it's a lot. And I usually come to the end of every episode with a sticky note that has positives and negatives mm-hmm. on it. I was struggling last night. I didn't put anything down for the negatives because I couldn't think of anything. Right. But that really is the only thing I can think of is that line Yeah. where it would have been nicer if we kind of just had, <laughs> you know what? I'm going to the lake. Yeah. yeah. Done. You know, so I think that kind of prevents me from giving it the perfect 10. But out of 10 glasses of contaminated water, I will be joining you and giving signs a 9.5 hey. out of 10. I just think that it's remarkable and I want to go, I guess, to watch more M. Night now. Yeah. <laughs> Start with rewatching The Village. Uh, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all from us at Podmortem. What would you rate signs and what should we watch next? Let us know on Twitter at the Podmortem. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook. Be sure to follow each of us on Twitter at Blood and Smoke, at Real Streeter 84, and at Travis MWH. Please consider pledging to our Patreon and stay tuned until after the music for a special shout out to our Wendigo Getter patrons. And remember, there are times when the universe tells you exactly what you need to know. You just have to be open to seeing the signs. Until next time. Thank you for staying tuned for a special thank you to our Wendigo Getter patrons. Ooh. Yeah. Thank you all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't we be? Yeah, we should be. <laughs> Just, Let's we make should a secret them. language with them. Yeah. I, I have no faith in us. <laughs> <laughs> a special thank you to Chris Ontiveros, Kristen Lofton, Megan Martinez, Kimberly Bass, Melanie Van Houston, Sophie Hodson, Anthony Jerome M., Jordan Nash, Kent Morton, Guy54, Lala Thomas, Travis Anissa Hunter, Miguel Myers ATX, Mandy, Jennifer Perez, Pierre Lombard, Allison O'Neill, Carissa, TJ Bronson, Gabrielle Trevino, Spooky Mom, Andy Teague, Applin Ontiveros, Karima Rhodes, Antonio Huerta, Kimberly Kleindienst, Will Brown, Linda, Sydney Smith, Osvaldo Soto, Jonathan Booth, Bobby Holmes, Donna Eason, J.D. Rizak, Molly Gerhardt, Armand Spasto, Aaron Aguirre, Eggy, William Berry, Brittany Ramatar, Charity Oxner, Amanda Six, Mandy Rainwater, Garrett Rogers, Jordan Roberts, Danielle Peralta, Dylan, Melissa Sierra, Holly Bryan, Alex Schultz, Jordan Blevins, Michelle Moore, Liz Heath, and Spencer Montalvo. Woo! (laughs) (laughs) Thank y'all so much. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we appreciate you for giving a crop. (laughs) (laughs) Damn it, that's better than mine. No, it's not. (laughs) Here's the script. I just want to say that we appreciate each and every one of you for being behind (laughs) us (laughs) like the kid the kid he was very afraid speaking english (laughs) for some reason scared him into english (laughs) so when you're speaking another language you're fucking scared (laughs) thank you all until next time